First of all, before we get started today, um, I did want to share some very sad news for our department, which is that our professor, James Swan, passed away this past uh, evening, uh, overnight. Um, he's, he was 39 years old and recently tenured and an incredible colleague and scholar, mentor and teacher. We are incredibly saddened by his loss and uh, are really still processing the fact that he's no longer with us. Uh, he was an amazing person who loved students and spent so much of his time dedicated to working with the students in his research lab, working with the students in the classes that he taught. He was an incredibly dedicated teacher. And uh, he was a brilliant mind uh, working in the area of computational fluid mechanics and soft matter. Um, we are going to miss him incredibly. And I just uh, would like to take a moment of silence uh, to remember Jim Swan. Thank you. Now, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, namesake for this lectureship, Daniel I.C. Wong. This is a particularly special Frontiers of Biotechnology lecture. It has always been named after D.I.C. Wong and is now is an endowed uh, lectureship. And it's because of the legacy that he left uh, Professor Daniel I.C. Wong received his bachelor's degree in 1959 and his master's in 1961 from MIT. And he got his PhD from, from the University of Pennsylvania in 1963. Uh, he then spent two years in the Army at the U.S. Army Biological Labs at uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland. And he joined the MIT faculty immediately afterward in 1965. Now, Professor Wong founded the Biotechnology Process Engineering Center, known as BPEC, through the NSF Engineering Research Center Initiative, and acted as its director from 1985 to 1998. His summer short course was the longest running and is the most successful on campus. He was subsequently named as an Institute Professor of Chemical Engineering at MIT in 1996. And in 2000, Professor Wong was given the Temesek Professorship at the National University of Singapore where he would devote a large amount of his time at that time to help Singapore in their biomedical science research and development. Professor Wong has received many awards, including from the American Chemical Society, the Marvin J. Johnson Award, and the David Perlman Memorial Lecture. He has also received awards from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the Food, Pharmaceutical, and Bioengineering Award, Institute Lecturer, and William H. Walker Award. He was given the Amgen Award in Biochemical Engineering from the Engineering Foundation. He has also received the Asia Pacific Biochemical Medical, Biochemical Medical and Biological Engineering Award, Academic, Academia Seneca, and the International Institute of Biotechnology. He's consulted for over 50 companies, and he was on the board of directors and science advisory boards of a number of public and private companies. He authored and co-authored five books and over 250 publications and 15 patents. Professor Wan established the world of biotechnology. The work from his lab allowed us to translate everything from antibodies to a range of other therapeutic medicines and make them real. And his technology is what we are honoring today. Next slide here is just showing him in the Army, him as a young man, and here he is uh, uh, with uh, Professor Cooney and colleagues hanging out. We'd like to thank 
Dr. Nubar Afayan, the sponsor of the Daniel I.C. Wong Lectureship. He is our very own alumnus. He earned his, uh, he entered biotechnology during its emergence as an academic field and industry, completing his doctoral work in biochemical engineering at MIT in 1987. Of course, he worked with Professor Wong. During his career as an inventor, an entrepreneur, and CEO, Nubar has co-founded and helped build over 50 life science and technology startups. These companies include Moderna, Kodiak, Denali, and many others. Prior to founding Flagship Pioneering, Nubar was the founder and CEO of Perceptive Biosystems, a leader in bioinstrumentation that grew to $100 million in annual revenues. After Perceptive's acquisition by Perkin Elmer Aplera Corporation in 1998, he became Senior Vice President and Chief Business Officer of, of Aplera, where he initiated and oversaw the creation of Solera Genomics. He has written numerous scientific publications and is the inventor of more than 80 patents. He is a lecturer at Harvard Business School and from 2000 to 2016 was a senior lecturer at MIT Sloan School of Management. He teaches and speaks around the world on topics ranging from entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic development to biological engineering, new medicines, and renewable energy. He is a member of the MIT Corporation and our department's visiting committee. Now I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Melissa Moore, who received her bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology uh, from the College of William and Mary, and her PhD degree in biological chemistry from MIT. She began working on RNA metabolism during her postdoc with Phil Sharp at MIT. After 13 years at Brandeis University, Dr. Moore joined the University of Massachusetts Medical School in 2007. She served as professor of biochemistry and molecular pharmacology and was the Eleanor Eustace Farrington Chair in Cancer Research and Investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Moore was also uh, a uh, founder and co-director of the RNA Therapeutics Institute at University of Massachusetts and was instrumental in the creation of the Massachusetts Therapeutic and Entrepreneurship Realization Initiative, Mass Terry, a faculty-led program intended to facilitate the translation of discoveries from UMass into drugs, products, technologies, and companies. Dr. Moore's research encompassed a broad array of topics related to the role of RNA and RNA protein complexes in gene expression and touched on many human diseases, including cancer, neurodegeneration, and preeclampsia. Since October 2016, Melissa is the Chief Scientific Officer mRNA research platform at Moderna Therapeutics. In her role as CSO, Dr. Melissa Moore is responsible for leading all mRNA biology research at Moderna. Dr. Moore's honors include a Searle Scholars Award, a David and Lucille Packard Fellowship, and the 2011 ASBMB William C. Rose Award. She was elected into the National Academy of Science in 2017 and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2019. I am really excited to have our colleague, uh, Dr. Moore, speak today, hear her insights, having led Moderna, and uh, this incredible and amazing journey uh, to create a vaccine. So, Melissa, please come on up. All right, well, thank you very much, Paula, and it's so wonderful to be here. Um, it was funny when I was coming in today because um, I spent so much of my life here at MIT, first in Building 18 uh, in the chemistry department with Chris Walsh for four and a half years, although he moved over to Harvard Medical School at one point, but then um, in the Cancer Center with Phil Sharp uh, over here for five years. And so this building wasn't here then, so I, I came in the, the, the old Media Lab building, and they said, no, 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 uh, go around the corner. So, um, but it's, it's always wonderful to uh, be home, and I uh, giving lecture here and in front of uh, old colleagues and, and friends. Um, and so I really do want to thank Paula and uh, Nubar um, uh, for uh, inviting me to be the uh, Daniel uh, I.C. Wang, Wang uh, Memorial uh, Lectureship. Uh, it's a great honor, so thank you. So if I could have the first slide. All right, so before I, I start, 
I just want to say that everything I'll talk about today, really, um, it takes a city, not just a village, but a city to do what Moderna has done. And this is a picture of the company in about 2018 when we were about 500 people. Uh, we're now over 2,000 people. Um, and I um, just want to thank all of my colleagues. And I just wish that uh, the entire world could see how hard everyone inside Moderna, particularly my colleagues in technical development and manufacturing and regulatory uh, and clinical worked over the last year, uh, was just such dedication to um, roll out mRNA-1273. Uh, it was truly, truly a heroic uh, team effort. So I just want to start uh, this talk, uh, especially for the students and postdocs, to give you a little perspective. It really has been uh, only less than a century since the advent of modern medicines. And so, in fact, um, what I'm showing here is the, one of the first modern medicines was Prontosil, which is a sulfonamide. Um, and that's a, it's the first antibiotic. It made a huge difference uh, in World War II, as well as uh, penicillin. Um, and so those were some of the very early small molecules. But then, of course, in, in the years since, we have painkillers, we have uh, mood enhancers, we have statins. And uh, of course, all of these small molecules and spurned a huge industry that have uh, made huge differences in people's lives. Now, of course, there's another type of medicine, which is a preventive medicine, the vaccines. Uh, and here I'm showing smallpox and polio. And again, these have made really the biggest differences for public health uh, worldwide. Um, but there's a third class of medicines that have emerged in uh, recent years, and that's, those are biologics. And biologics are, you know, basically proteins. And I want to point out that this is the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. So at the University of Toronto, they've been celebrating all year uh, of the discovery of, of insulin. Um, and so uh, one of the ways to, to think about this is, well, how important are each of these classes of medicine been? And it's hard to, to get a number on this, but and I'm afraid to show this because Nubar's here. Um, <laughs> but uh, one, one of the things that I pulled this off the web, and this is a, a um, picture of just the, the, the 2019 top selling pharma drugs just by billions of dollars in sales. Now that's not necessarily impact, but it is one measure. And um, most of you who watch any TV in the evenings will recognize all of these names because you're constantly bombarded with, with these, uh, these brands. But if we instead step back a minute and look at um, what are the classes, what three, what of the classes of molecules are these in, what you can see is that two thirds of these top 15 really are biologics. So biologics have been, really been taking over uh, as really an important class of medicines. Now, biologics um, are proteins, as I said, and um, the, the, the kinds of proteins that are most often used for biologics are monoclonal antibodies. And monoclonal antibodies, for those of you who are in the room, th that's an antibody up there. But this is uh, one of my favorite posters from the PDB, and this shows just all the different kinds of proteins that the body makes. And so um, there are many, many other proteins that could be used as therapeutics. But the problem with biologics is that, as, they're, as they have been traditionally made, is that they're made outside of the body and then purified as proteins and then injected into the body. So they need current day biologics need to be able to work in the bloodstream or in your biological fluids, so outside of cells. And yet, fully two-thirds of the human proteome is either transmembrane or intracellular. So it is not the realm uh, of biologics. And so the idea of mRNA therapeutics is simply instead to insert the instructions to make proteins um, into your cells, and then you, your body can make its own medicines and can make any of the types of proteins. And so therefore, the entire proteome, as shown on that previous slide, is potentially um, uh, available to be used as a medicine. So what is it, uh, and the, the other promise of, of mRNA medicines is that if we could figure out how to make it work once, 
we could make it work over and over again simply by changing the sequence of the messenger RNA. And this really is the promise of the entire field that's emerging of nucleic acid medicines. So mRNA uh, is, is one of those. Another are antisense uh, oligonucleotides and uh, small interfering RNAs. Uh, so small interfering RNAs from alnylam, antisense oligonucleotides, the best known company there is, is Ionis. Um, and so all of these nucleic acid medicines are what uh, I would call information-containing medicines, because once you've figured out all the, how to deliver that medicine to the, to the right cell type, and then what are the uh, dose-limiting toxicities and how to get around that, then you can simply make a new medicine by changing the sequence. So it's much, much faster to make new medicines. So if, why has it taken so long for mRNAs to become medicines? So here I'm showing you a timeline from a, um, a review that uh, Katie Carrico and her colleagues wrote a couple of years ago, um, doc documenting uh, the fact that mRNA was first discovered in 1961. So I note that that was 60 years ago this year uh, mRNA was discovered. Um, and actually, pretty soon after the discovery of mRNA, you'll, you'll see that second red box there. It was discovered that if you tried to uh, put mRNA into cells, you got a very strong interferon response. And we'll talk about that a little later. But basically what that means is that our bodies have a very, do, our bodies do not like messenger RNAs coming in from outside our cells. And the reason for that is that the most common form of viruses that infect mammalian cells are RNA viruses. And so we have, um, uh, over the millennia and over millions of years, developed very strong innate immune pathways to recognize RNA coming from the outside, bad. Um, let's let's uh, not do that. So it took another um, many years before it, uh, it was recognized that this interferon response in induced by single-stranded RNAs were due to activation of the toll-like receptors. So that's that third box that you can see there, TLR7 and TLR8. And then it was soon after that that uh, Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman published a seminal paper showing that um, if you put in a RNA where you have a modified nucleotide that is not recognized by the toll-like receptors, then uh, it's no longer um, it no longer activates the innate immune system. And so it was this discovery and a number of others that then led to the founding of both Moderna and a number of other companies uh, that um, are currently pursuing mRNA therapeutics. So, so what does it take to make mRNA medicines? So the first thing we need is a very efficient method to make large quantities of mRNAs. Um, and it is amazing how much mRNA we're making now. When I was a postdoc, I was doing transcription reactions on a 50 microliter, 100 microliter scale. And now we're doing it on uh, tens and hundreds of liters scale. It's, it's really quite uh, amazing. Um, we need the ability to avoid the innate immune sensors that defend against RNA viruses. I talked about, about that. We need efficient and well-tolerated delivery methods, and we need a knowledge of how to engineer the best mRNA sequence for a particular purpose. And so I'm going to take you through just some of the history of all of these, these four uh, points. And so um, how do you make a large mRNA? Now, you can't do it by complete chemical synthesis. I know this is chemical engineering, and you guys would like to do that, but uh, really the, the maximum for, for currently chemically synthesizing an RNA molecule is about 120 nucleotides. Your typical messenger RNA is somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000, 4,000 nucleotides. So it's really not possible to make it by complete chemical synthesis. And so the method that uh, everyone in the industry uses uh, was first described in 1984 uh, in Michael Green's lab at Harvard. And this was to take a polymerase, a single subunit polymerase from a bacteriophage. In, in this paper, um, they, this is the, the first paper, they were using SP6. We now use T7 RNA polymerase. Um, but the idea is the same. And uh, that polymerase will recognize a short sequence on a DNA called a promoter. And then once it recognizes it, it will land on the promoter and uh, just 
chug out lots and lots of copies of the, the RNA. Um, and in the same uh, issue of nucleic acid research, Doug Melton uh, actually made a messenger RNA. So uh, he transcribed a messenger RNA and injected it into the uh, oocytes of Xenophis, a, a frog, uh, and could show that he could make, uh, get beta globin made. And I love this gel because it actually shows the dose-dependent effect. So mRNAs really are drugs because you have a dose-dependent effect. Uh, so this was the first demonstration of a um, in vitro transcribed RNA uh, made outside of the, the body and put in to a cell that you could then uh, use to make proteins. Okay, now what about today? Now today, uh, I'm zipping forward uh, many years here. Um, at Moderna, we have four different mRNA manufacturing trains up and running. We have our preclinical train, which we uh, make about, we were able to make about 500 per month now. These, these numbers are a little old. And, and we're well over 25,000 different mRNAs that we've made uh, at this point. But, and that preclinical is on the scale of about 10 milligrams. So that's something that is similar to what I would have done in the lab when I was a, a postdoc. Uh, but we also have our personalized vaccine unit. And for, for this, this is a, a collaboration that we've had with Merck for many years. And what we're doing here is to um, uh, take a sample of a patient's tumor and then take a sample of their blood deep sequence both to find mutations that are present in the tumor that are not present in their normal tissue, and then make a messenger RNA where we string together a bunch of peptides that the immune system should be able to recognize as specific to the tumor and not to the person, and make a vaccine for one person. So this is truly personalized medicine. Now we need to, to make this um, vaccine very quickly, and we need to make it in clinical grade material, so-called GMP grade material. So uh, we've done hundreds, uh, over 100, well over 100 of these to date. And these, um, this train gives us about, a, um, about 100 milligrams of RNA uh, at, at clinical grade quality. Now I'm going into this uh, in a little detail because this, you'll come back to this when we talk about the vaccine. This was imp really important that we had this train up and running uh, to, to enable us to make mRNA 1273 so quickly. Then we have our clinical um, grade, uh, just this is for our clinical trials where we're making um, quantities of RNA in up to about 75 grams. And now, of course, we have our commercial trains where we're making uh, more than 500 grams at a time. So the, for any of you who have ever made RNA, for me to, to have imagined in 19... 89 when I joined Phil Sharp's lab that we would be making RNA at 500 grams at a time is just unbelievable to me. But uh, we, we, have, we have worked out the ability to do it in uh, very efficiently. Okay, so we have the ability to make lots of RNA now. Now, again, the second thing was we needed the ability to avoid these innate immune sensors that defend against RNA viruses. I talked a bit about this. Um, and you can see there we have, uh, I'm showing an mRNA coming into the cell via a lipid nanoparticle. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But to the cell, that looks very much like a virus trying to enter the cell. And so there are a number of, of sensors that, that in, um, sense both single-stranded RNA and double-stranded RNA because, of course, RNA viruses, in order to replicate, have to go through a double-stranded stage. Um, and so we need way, we really needed to find ways to avoid these innate immune sensors. Now, I love this paper that was published in uh, 2004 uh, because what these uh, researchers did is they took uh, the um, uh, macrophages from mice and they incubated those macrophages with some polymers, so either poly A, poly C, poly G, or, or poly I, or poly U. Uh, and then looked for IFN alpha, which again, which is an um, output of an, an innate immune stimulation. And so macrophages are part of the innate immune system. And they're very sensitive to single-stranded RNA. And I think what you can see from the um, panel on the left is that the, the problem here, what was being recognized is you, right? None of the other nucleotides uh, were being recognized. And then on the panel on the right, what they did is they took a mouse that was a knockout mouse for this toll-like receptor, TLR7, which I've illustrated the structure of up there on the upper left. And um, 
they incubated uh, macrophages, again, from either a, a wild-type mouse, that's that C7, C57 BL6 mouse, or the TLR7 knockout mouse, and uh, with different RNA molecules, so RNA, mRNA that included flu or, or GFP and you can, or poly-U, and you can see that uh, if you knock out that receptor, you no longer get the IFN-alpha response. But the CPG, which is, that's DNA, so there are other um, receptors that recognize DNA, that's a negative control. So that shows that they hadn't knocked out the entire innate immune system. So um, the, the structure of the uh, toll-like receptors really revealed what the potential answer could be. Because really what these are, they're, they're, these, they're these molecules that uh, swing together and when it can recognize two uh, U's, uh, in, this, in this active site that's in between the two subunits, then that gives, it puts it in a confirmation where it does signaling. And so the idea is that if you can instead use a version of uracil that uh, is no longer able to be recognized by the toll-like receptor, that should be able to then uh, get you around the, the problem. But of course, the U also has to code for the protein, so you can't mess with the Watson-Crick face, and so you gotta mess with the, the Hoegstein face, the backside of the molecule. Um, and so our favorite, um, uh, modified nucleotide is 1-methylpseudouridine. Um, and that is now how we, what we do with our RNA. So all of the RNA that we make at Moderna and put into our vaccines and our therapeutics, we completely substitute all of the uracils with 1-methylpseudou. Um, and that still is able to faithfully encode the, the protein. Now just to show you uh, so a little bit of data from a paper that we published, uh, just to, um, to really show that, that in mice this is, this is crucial. Uh, here's what we did is to put in an oligonucleotide that's either 19 U's or 19 one methyl pseudo U's. And then um, we injected it and after six hours we took out the spleens and looked at the B cells. Now B cells are part of the adaptive immune system, but when the innate immune system gets irritated and activated, it talks to the adaptive immune system and activates it too. And so you can, you can uh, look at the percentage of activated B cells, and that's what all that stuff on the, the um, y-axis means. It means what percentage of the cells are activated. Um, and you can see that when we put in the U19 oligo, we got lots of activated B cells, but not with the one methyl pseudo U. Now, um, that solves the, the uh, TLR7, uh, TLR8 uh, problem up there at the very top, but what about double-stranded RNA? Now, double-stranded RNA is a problem because um, our manufacturing process using T7 RNA polymerase, like any manufacturing process, sometimes, you know, you get what you want, but you also get side products that you don't want. And uh, T7 has a tendency in in vitro transcription reactions to make uh, impurities, some of which are double-stranded RNA. And that's a real problem because the double-stranded RNA is a, a very potent um, activator of the innate immune system. So uh, we published uh, last year, or when was this? Yes, last year, uh, a paper in Science Advances where we had um, talked about how, how did we reduce this double-stranded RNA in our, uh, in, uh, in our RNA preparations. And one, was, one simple way was simply to play with the transcription reaction conditions, good chemical engineering here, and, um, and see whether we could find conditions that had the lowest amount of double-stranded RNA. And so, uh, here what we're showing is using IFN beta as a readout of innate immune activation, you can see that there is a, a corner over there where we get very low innate immune activation. Um, we also have developed very sensitive assays for detecting double-stranded RNA. This is a, an ELISA assay where we have two different antibodies that recognize double-stranded RNA and so can get a very sensitive readout. And so um, what we are showing here is just the amount of double-stranded RNA that we can get to uh, using these process modifications that we've made compared to the legacy process. And by the legacy process, what we mean is uh, the, the transcription conditions that are published um, 
uh, the, in methods of enzymology or, or that are in kits that people would use in their labs. And one of the things that I, I probably don't need to tell this group because you're probably not doing animal studies with RNA, but please, please, please do not put RNA from a, in a transcription reaction that, that you did from a kit in an animal. It will not be good for the animal. You've got to get rid of this double-stranded RNA. Um, so what we wanted to see is, okay, we were able to get that double-stranded RNA, but was it good enough to just get rid of the double-stranded RNA? Uh, and so what we're doing here is we took human uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, differentiated them into macrophages, again, those innate immune cells, and we are now measuring uh, as another readout of the innate immune system, um, IP10 mRNA levels. And what you can see is that just by uh, reducing the uh, amount of double-stranded RNA, we've really reduced that uh, innate immune signature. But you actually really need to both you know, have that reduce the double-stranded RNA and put in the modified nucleotides to get down to uh, almost uh, no innate immune signature. So um, the so we now have um, very very immune quiet RNA or innate immune quiet RNA. Now something that we have done recently, and we're just about to um, uh, submit a manuscript on this, and um, one of our researchers is giving a talk about it next week at the mRNA Health Conference, is we've actually said, well, why do, why do we have to worry about getting rid of this double-stranded RNA? Let's just not make it in the first place. And so we've now engineered T7 RNA polymerase to just not even make the uh, double-stranded RNA. And if you're interested in hearing about this, we every year do a annual science day where we communicate advances in our science and technology to the public and investors, and it's on our website. So if you're interested in learning more about how we did this, you can uh, just go to the investor tab on our website and find this. Okay, so now what about um, delivery vehicles? So you need a delivery vehicle for two reasons. One is you've got to get that big RNA molecule across the cell membrane. Um, it doesn't know how to get across it by itself. And the other problem is that your body sees mRNA as food. Now, I saw a bunch of you eating lunch out there today, and when you're eating that whole wholesome food, actually you're eating a lot of RNA. There's um, more RNA in your cells than DNA. And the, of the dry weight of your cells, the ribosome, which is a lot of it is, is RNA, is something like 20 or 30 percent of the dry weight. And so you ate a lot of RNA. Um, and so in your digestive system and also in your bloodstream, there are lots and lots of RNases that, whose job it is to digest those RNA molecules down to nucleotides so that they can then be built back up inside your cells into RNA molecules. And so if we don't do something to protect the RNA when we inject it into the body, it, with one exception, um, it will rapidly be broken down and not get to where it's going. So this is the, the one exception. Um, this is a paper that came out in Science in uh, 1990. And uh, what these researchers showed um, is that they could make a messenger RNA for beta-galactosidase. And beta-galactosidase is an enzyme that when you give it a particular substrate, uh, things will turn blue. And so what you can see there in the top right is a um, cross-section of skeletal muscle where they injected the RNA for beta-galactosidase that encoded beta-galactosidase into the skeletal muscle of mice, and it actually made uh, enough enzyme that the skeletal muscles would, would turn blue if you gave them the right substrate. Um, so in that case, they did not require any uh, special uh, delivery system. Um, and so this uh, same... Uh, same experiment was repeated at Moderna, so these are some early data from Moderna, using either luciferase, an mRNA that encoded luciferase, or an mRNA that encoded uh, erythropoietin. And what you can see on the left-hand side, and it was some of these early data that I saw uh, on a poster that then uh, convinced me that, oh wow, this is a thing. Um, it's, it's actually going to work. But it was amazing to me. So. Um, you could inject the mRNA into the hindquarters there of the mice. And uh, what you can see, again, is that you get uh, a drug-like effect. So uh, you have both 
um, a, a dose dependent effect and it's a time limited effect. And so those are, those are good, uh, both of those are properties of, of, of drugs. And then on the right hand side, uh, this is a me measuring erythropoietin in the blood and erythropoietin is involved in um, hematopoiesis. And so at the, at the panel in the bottom shows that that erythropoietin that was made was actually active because it was the, the mice were making more red blood cells, their hematocrit was going up, they had more hemoglobin, uh, and again, got a dose-dependent uh, protein effect. So um, now we use m many different routes of administration. Now the only, the sole route of administration that we actually inject naked RNA is in this intercardiac injection. So this is a uh, collaboration, a longstanding collaboration that we've had with AstraZeneca. And in this collaboration, what we're injecting is the messenger RNA that encodes VEGF. VEGF is a uh, protein that um, is the signal to grow new blood vessels. And so for patients that have had heart attacks due to blockage of the blood vessels of their heart muscle, um, during open heart surgery, the, the surgeons are actually injecting the mRNA directly into the heart muscle to enable them to grow new blood vessels. And that's a wonderful use of mRNA because mRNA is very time limited. So you can imagine it, you want that signal to be there for a short time and then you want it to go away because you don't want to overgrow the blood vessels. You don't want the blood vessels to grow somewhere else. Um, and so uh, injecting mRNA into muscle is, is you, can, you can do it without a delivery vehicle. But for all of our other um, routes of administration, we need some kind of delivery vehicle uh, in order for the, the RNA to get to the place where we want it to go. Um, and so the delivery vehicles that we use are uh, lipid nanoparticles. And basically what we're doing is simply clothing the mRNA in fats. So we're hiding the mRNA from the RNases in, inside of lipids or fats. And so there are five major components of lipid nanoparticles. Um, and it's uh, one, one of the pioneers, of course, of lipid nanoparticles is in the room, Bob Langer and his group. Um, so the, of course, we have the mRNA. We have the uh, ionizable lipid that interacts with the mRNA. So the way that we get the um, fats to stick to the RNA is that RNA is, is inherently negatively charged because there's a phosphate backbone. These ionizable lipids become positively charged at low pH, and so then they associate with the RNA. Um, and then we're able to form a membrane around that with a phospholipid. We normally use DSPC, which is a component of human lung surfactant. And then a, a sterol, like cholesterol, enhances the membrane fluidity. Um, and then the final component is a PEG lipid. And the PEG lipid's job is once we have the uh, lipid nanoparticles made, and we, if we put them in a vial, they're soft materials. And if they were bumping into each other, they'd keep aggregating and getting bigger and bigger. Um, and we don't want that to happen. And so PEG provides sort of a brush border on the outside to keep them from interacting with each other and, and growing bigger. Um, so that's, that's an artist rendition of what one of our lipid nanoparticles uh, looks like. Now, these lipid nanoparticles, um, really what we're doing is we are mimicking what the body does naturally to move fats around the body. So you've all heard of LDL and HDL, but there are many other kinds of lipid transport complexes in the body. And um, on this scale, our lipid nanoparticles uh, are somewhere in between the VLDL and the chylomicron particles. But we can engineer these different kinds of particles are picked up by different cell types, depending on uh, what kinds of lipids are in them and what the structure on the outside is. So what we do is we try to engineer the lipid nanoparticles with different structures on the outside so that then they are directed to different cell types. And we can do that engineering, that chemical uh, engineering, um, by varying a number of different things. We can vary the, the chemical structure of the molecules. So for example, that, that uh, ionizable lipid, we have many different versions of that. We can uh, vary the phospholipid, we can vary the sterol. We can vary the composition. So what are the ratios of these components that you put in? 
Um, and then we vary the process by which we put them together. Do you put them all together at once or do you put a couple together and bring in something else and what, what do you do in between? And so all of those things, we have a huge team that focuses on how do we build lipid nanoparticles in a, um, in, in, a, um, in a way that can then enable us to get into uh, very many different cell types. Now, what we care about uh, on the downstream is, of course, when it's in the vial, we want it to be chemically and physically stable. Um, once we get it into the body, we want it to have the biodistribution that we care about and tolerability. And then once it gets into cells, the, um, the lipid nanoparticle has to let go of the RNA so that the RNA can get out into the cell and be used to make proteins. So we're trying to find often the Goldilocks zone in between all of these different uh, things at once. And we have published uh, uh, multiple papers on our lipid nanoparticles. Uh, the one on the right describes our ionizable lipid SM102, which is in the uh, mRNA-1273 uh, vaccine. Now, one of the things that, some of the things that we do might surprise you. So we not only have um, biologists and molecular biologists and cell biologists and chemical engineers and chemists, but we also have a lot of physicists at uh, Moderna. And um, so we do a lot of physics. So here, for example, we do cryo-electron microscopy. This is a picture of our lipid nanoparticles in the cryo-EM. We do atomic force microscopy. This is a picture of our lipid nanoparticles. And you can see this allows us to, to, not, to look at their deformability. Um, we uh, do uh, NMR of them to look at the dynamics of things moving in and out. We uh, have our own uh, X-ray gun to do small angle X-ray scattering that tells us about the, the internal structure of our lipid nanoparticles. And then we've even gone down to um, the uh, Brookhaven National Labs to do small angle neutron scattering. So we really care very deeply about achieving deep mechanistic understanding of when we vary things, how does that vary the structure of our, our lipid nanoparticles. The other thing that I like to note about this figure is that I think some of these images are beautiful. And in fact, we have turned them into artwork that I call mod modern art. And, it, and this artwork adorns our, our um, if you come to Moderna and you go to the third floor cafeteria, you'll see uh, exactly these pictures on the walls. Okay, so finally, we need a knowledge of how to engineer the best mRNA sequence for a particular purpose. And in order to understand this, I need to give you a little bit of an anatomy lesson of, of, RNA, of mRNA. So the important part of an mRNA molecule, and by the way, I'm showing it as a cigar here. That is not what an mRNA molecule looks like. An RNA molecule is a big, long, floppy thing, like I showed you in the, in the first images. Um, but this allows me to just give you a, a quick uh, tour. So the coding sequence is the sequence of the, of the uh, mRNA that encodes the desired protein. And of course, the protein synthesis machinery needs to know where to start and where to stop. And so there are, there's a green start signal and a red stop signal at the, those, the ends of that. And then going out from there, there are what are called the untranslated regions. Um, and those contain, uh, can contain regulatory elements for uh, how, how quickly the, the uh, translation machinery loads onto the RNA and then what cell types, for example, is it uh, translated in. And then at the very ends, there's something called the poly A tail, which is a string of adenosines. And at the other end is a special structure called the, the five prime cap. And these are important, and they're rec both recognized by the, the translation machinery, the machinery that makes proteins, but also to protect the RNA from being chewed on by um, uh, little Pac-Man or exoribonucleases in the cell. So what we want to, in terms of engineering um, our mRNAs, we, of course, always want translation to start at the right place. It turns out we've um, discovered as, um, as, and a lot of times doing the research that we do, we bump up into the frontier of our knowledge of, of what we know. And we discovered a, a number of years ago now that in, in the cell, um, in your cells, translation actually, the, the, the translation machinery misses that start codon like 30% of the time. So we didn't want it to do that. So we, we had to understand why it missed it and then how to fix that. So we've now fixed that. 
Um, of course, we want it to be faithfully decoded. We want it to make the right protein. We want it to stop at the right place. Then um, we also want to be able to modulate the duration of the pharmacology. So how much protein is made, and then how long does the mRNA make protein? Because mRNAs are naturally unstable molecules. The average half-life of an endogenous mRNA is somewhere around uh, four to, to eight hours. Um, but of course, we'd love it, to, we'd love it to, to last much longer, or sometimes we want just a very short burst of protein. So we need to understand those engineering principles. And then uh, we can engineer the mRNA to be uh, translated only in certain cell types by putting in signals that cause the RNA to get degraded in cell types where we don't desire it to be um, translated. And then we also tailor the mRNA sequence to a particular cell type. Now, just to give you a sense of one of these engineering problems, I want to talk about the coding sequence. So how do you decide, just a simple thing, and, and again, I want to point out that when we made mRNA 1273, we made on January 13th, I believe, of 2020, we made one mRNA sequence that we put on that personalized cancer vaccine train. One. We played some backups. We made one. And it went through, and that's the one that when it has been in my arm and in your arm. Um, so we were so confident that we knew how to make the right sequence, that we could go with one. It still gives me shivers to think about this. It's, it's really amazing. You'll see how amazing it is in a second. The, the problem is the genetic code is redundant. So just like in English where there are multiple words that could mean the same thing, synonyms, the words that encode for amino acids in RNA, the codons, there are often multiple codons that encode for one amino acid. So for example, in this short peptide up there, lysine, proline, threonine, glutamic acid, asparagine, there are, for proline, there's, there's three different, or excuse me, four different codons that encode for proline, right? So if you do the math, then there's actually 128 different mRNA sequences that would encode for that single, that, that little peptide there. So that means that the number of um, possibilities of mRNA sequences that encode for any particular protein is a function of the, the number of codon choices for, for each amino acid and, and the number of times that amino acid appears in the protein. So let's think about the spike protein. So the SARS-CoV spike protein is 1,273 amino acids. If you do that math, it's a huge number. There's t over 10 to the 632 possible sequences that we could have made that would encode that protein. Now, how big is that number? The number of estimated atoms in the known universe is only 10 to the 80th. So it's, a, it's just a ridiculous number, right? So how are we so sure that we, we, and actually, we don't have to choose one, you know, we could choose many different sequences, but we want to be sure that we choose one that's going to work, because some of those aren't going to work. How did we know that? So we published a paper um, in 2019 where we uh, really investigated, again, the engineering principles for making a good coding sequence. And what we did was we used a um, protein called uh, green fluorescent protein, um, and we encoded it with uh, many, we made many different versions of it. Um, and so one of the features that we can vary is what was called codon optimality. Now I've told you that, that the genetic code, you know, there's multiple different synonyms, but we know in English there are, there are some synonyms that were used more often than others, right? And so there's some that are more optimal than others, and that's true of codons too. Your um, protein machinery, protein synthesis machinery, um, has more of the tRNAs that recognize these particular codons. And so there's underlying this, this colors, um, there's a, there are numbers that have been derived for optimal codons in, the, in human cells. Now the other thing about mRNA is that it is, um, it can adopt secondary structures because mRNA is a single-stranded nucleic acid, but of course it could fold up on itself and make helices and all kinds of other structures. And so whenever you vary the sequence of an RNA, you're going to vary the, the, its capacity to make structure and how strong those structures are. 
So uh, here what we're, I'm showing are three different sequences. These are the coding sequences for green fluorescent protein. Um, and you can see that uh, I'm showing you the, the folding energy, or delta G. Basically, what that, that number means is the more negative that is, the higher the structure. And so all three of these, these sequences would, would encode the same protein, but they have very different propensities to make structure. So we asked the question, um, well, let me, let me uh, explain the system for a second. Um, the system that we're using here is a green fluorescent protein with a Degron tag on it, and this makes the protein very unstable. And this enables us to um, uh, watch in, in put the RNA into cells and then watch the RNA come and go. And then from that, we can aggregate all of that intensity in the image and get the um, a translation rate and an mRNA half-life of that with using various differential equations, right? And then if we uh, make a different sequence, and I don't know if these movies are going to play. Um, yeah, they're not going to play. But you can see that this, with a different sequence, you get a, a different kinetics of, uh, of protein expression, right? And so we can, this is the system that we were using to understand these engineering principles. So what we did was we asked, um, what if we now look at the relationship between codon optimality versus RNA structure? And uh, how big is this landscape? So um, we, couldn't, we can make a lot of mRNAs, but we can't make enough mRNAs to, to totally investigate this landscape. So what we did is we computationally uh, looked at 150,000 different uh, sequences for green fluorescent protein where we just randomly chose codons to see uh, how big, how, did, how much did that cover this space. And you can see it, it doesn't really cover it very much. We also then um, tried, well, what if you weight, weight the codon choices to what's present in the human genome? It didn't really cover the space that much. So what we did is we pushed the computer algorithm to, to, to see where the extremes were. And um, we came up with this cloud. So the possibilities are much greater than what exists in, in nature. Now, um, what we did is we couldn't test 150,000 different things, so we picked um, six different regions on this, this space, and in each one of those squares, we made five different uh, mRNAs with, with different sequences. And then we, um, we put them into cells and, and got out the data. Now, I'm not going to show you all the data, but here's the money shot. Basically, what this shows is if you look at the area under the curve, that's what's shown in the bottom right-hand corner, that's how much protein is made from the, what the total protein output from that. Um, that if we make mRNAs that are up in that upper right-hand corner of our graph, so in the green box, we can, that have high structure and optimal codons, then we can, we're always guaranteed that we're going to get an mRNA that is, uh, you know, expresses good, good protein. Obviously, if we make things with low structure and poor codons, we get very little protein expression, sometimes no protein expression, so we stay out of that area. So that's how we were able to pick that sequence for mRNA-1273. Uh, we knew that if we stayed up in that upper green area, we were going to be, be good. Now, we've published this... Um, these findings in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science in 2019. Um, we also have published a number, many uh, other papers, and we continue to try to understand these engineering principles for mRNA um, today. So i just um, putting up here a couple of our, our publications. So basically, we now have all of the, the things in place to make mRNA medicines. Um, and I just wanted to take you through, I have just a couple more slides, but just take you through very quickly the pathway that it, for making an mRNA medicine at Moderna. So it all starts with an idea for a new therapeutic protein. That's usually coming from one of our therapeutic areas. Um, we have uh, infectious disease. Well, I'll go through those in a second. Um, that then dictates the amino acid sequence for the protein. We then have developed these algorithms to um, then pop out an optimal uh, mRNA sequence for that. That's all done in Cambridge. That's then sent uh, digitally to, to Norwood, where they manufacture a plasma DNA um, that has a T7 promoter in it and has that, the sequence that we want downstream of it. They grow up that plasmid, purify the plasmid, and then cut it with an enzyme, add 
um, add the, um, the polymerase, make lots of RNA, and then and formulate it, get it in a vial, and it's ready to go in your arm. Um, so this enabled us, uh, and it was, it was really the, the fact that we had already in place um, the uh, personalized cancer vaccine uh, line, where we, we try to go from getting a patient's tumor sample to getting them their personalized vaccine in 45 days. Um, the fact that we already had that up and running enabled us to go from the idea of uh, what protein to make for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Um, the mRNA design literally took an hour to do, so we designed a drug in an hour. Um, that, it took 42 days to manufacture that and get that to NIH, and then nine months later, we had the um, emergency use authorization for uh, SARS-CoV-2 for our vaccine. And so um, our vaccine for uh, SARS-CoV-2 is just one of the many, many uh, products that, and, and um, therapeutics that we're currently working on. And so this gets out of date on a, a very, very rapidly. Um, so it, this is not quite up to date, almost. Um, but you can see that, that we're making lots and lots of, of uh, prophylactic vaccines. Uh, and many of these are, are either in clinical trials or going into clinical trials soon. Uh, we have the cancer vaccines, both for the personalized cancer vaccines, but also a uh, vaccine for common mutations in cancer. Um, so if there are common mutations that cause cancer, let's, you know, let's vaccinate us against cancer. I would love that. Um, we have intertumoral immuno-oncology products to try to get the, um, the immune system to attack tumors. Um, I told you about VEGF, and that's a regenerative therapeutic. Then we have a number of secreted and cell surface therapeutics. Uh, and we also have, at the bottom, these intracellular therapeutics. These are for uh, people who are born with inborn metabolic errors where they're missing a, an enzyme that is important for their metabolism. And so we're able to give them back the instructions to make that enzyme and, and, and fix that. And we're now in, in clinical trials for MMA and, and PA. Um, and we've just announced uh, in, in the earnings call that happened yesterday um, that we, that should be on this list, is um, uh, cystic fibrosis. So CFTR, the protein that, that causes cystic fibrosis, we've been working with uh, Vertex for a number of years uh, to develop an inhalable uh, lipid nanoparticle that could deliver that mRNA into the lungs to uh, help treat those patients that are not currently addressed. So finally, I just want to point out that one of the other amazing things about mRNA medicines is you don't have to make one at a time. So they are, um, you can add multiple different mRNAs to make a drug. And so here I'm giving an example of our, our vaccine against cytomegalovirus, which uh, in order to make this vaccine, you actually need to express six different proteins. And so basically what we do is we make six different mRNAs and formulate them all together. Uh, and then the cell gets those mRNA molecules and makes the proteins and, and puts them together in the right way. And so um, that's, that's just another amazing thing about messenger RNAs. You can, uh, it's multiplexable, I just want to say that. Okay, and so I just want to finish here by thanking you for your attention and again, just acknowledging um, this amazing group of people that I work with at Moderna, and, and thank you. So, uh, Melissa, first of all, I'd like to thank you for an incredible talk. I mean, that was so exciting and uh, I think tells us about the future of medicine. And I'd also like to present uh, the Daniel I.C. Wan Lecture Award. So we have it all packaged up nice for you. Oops. Here we are. <laughs> I'll put these things away, and we are going to take questions from the audience. Thank you, Paula. Yes. Thank you for a, a wonderful talk. Uh, maybe uh, too much of the technical detail, but just curious, when you have a multi-antigen uh, vaccine, do you formulate uh, 
the mRNA for all the antigens uh, together, or do you do that individually and then just mix the, the nanoparticles? Um, you could do it either way, but our preferred method would be to formulate them together. It's much easier. Yep, in the back. I'm interested if you, if you, what you've learned about dosing when you go into those clinical trials to enable the high probability of success first time. I'm sorry. I couldn't quite hear her. Maybe. Yeah. Is, can you share anything about what you've learned around dosing when you start those clinical trials to increase the likelihood of success? So I am not a clinician, and so I kind of shy away from those uh, questions, um, and so I will leave that to my clinical colleagues to answer. I'm sorry. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I was wondering if you could shed any light on the nature of the particle size distribution of the lipid nanoparticles and how does that affect the formulation and immu immunogenicity? Well, um, so that's, that's a really interesting question because we can, that's one of the things that we can vary when we're uh, varying the process. And we just published a paper uh, showing that um, having a little bit larger lipid nanoparticles is, is, can be, at least in mice, is good for immunogenicity. It turns out that when we went to primates, they didn't really seem to care very much. Um, so we do, for the, um, the clinical products, the GMP products, we do have a size range that is our, our, our cutoff uh, that we try to stay in between. But um, in general, we tend to, to use around 80 to 120 uh, nanometers. And yes, there is some distribution, but we try to keep that as close as possible. Yeah, so it's really interesting when you, the, what I worked on um, as an academician was actually um, mRNA processing in cells, so that's coming directly from cells as opposed to coming in from the outside. And there's, there's other rules, actually, in cells, because in cells, uh, most messenger RNAs are made from pre-mRNAs that had to be spliced and so have the introns removed, whereas with our current mRNAs, we don't do that. Um, and it turns out that that act of splicing is one of the most important things for maximizing protein output. Uh, and so um, I used to give lectures about 15 years ago to groups of um, industry uh, people who were interested in maximizing proteins from in cells, and I would basically tell them, you guys got to put an intron in there uh, to, to, to make, and, that, and it turns out if you put an intron at the beginning of the gene, then the codon optimality and the structure are actually less important uh, for endogenous mRNAs. And so um, it, it makes a good point that we have to learn the engineering principles for um, these these therapeutic RNAs, and they're actually somewhat different from endogenous RNAs. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah incredible, incredible talk, talk, incredible work. Um, I was curious uh, how, how far along you guys are and, and what the next targets are for uh, cell-specific expression, and to what extent uh, expression crosses the blood-brain barrier. So to my knowledge, um, there's not I don't know of anyone who's gotten lipid nanoparticles across the blood-brain barrier. I'll leave it at that. Um, in terms of, uh, what was the first question? Cell-targeted. Cell-targeted, right. Yes, so um, we um, often put microRNA target sites into the 3' UTRs of our mRNAs if we don't want them um, expressed in a certain cell type. So for example, um, MIR-122 is a very abundant microRNA in the liver. And so if we don't want something expressed in, the, in hepatocytes, then we can uh, put that in to the mRNA. We have similar target sites that um, are in immune cells, so we can, we can go either immune or hepatocyte. Uh, and we, you can imagine that we're working on to try to understand what are all the workable microRNAs in other cell types of, of interest. Um, a, a really great thing will be if we can do, that's, that's what I call an off-logic gate. If we do an on-logic gate, that would be even cooler, right? So then we'd only have it expressed in a desired cell type, 
And I can tell you we're working on that, um, and, but we're not, just not prepared to talk about it quite yet. As you've thought about code on optimization and increasing the yield, have there been any trade-offs that have come up in terms of cell health and what the cell is normally doing versus trying to make um, therapeutic mRNAs and proteins? Yeah, so this is a question I get when I talk a lot about, okay, we're trying to make as much protein as possible, right? And people start worrying, oh, are you going to take over the entire translational capacity of the cells? So um, I have a set of slides that I call translation by the numbers that I didn't show today. But um, I don't think we're ever going to in any way worry about the translational capacity of the cell. I mean, viruses completely take over. That's not what we're doing. So each of your cells contains between 200,000 and 300,000 messenger RNA molecules, and you have per cell about 3 million ribosomes, give or take 500,000 or so. Um, we are generally, on our best day, maybe putting in 100 messenger RNA molecules into a cell. So we're not getting anywhere close to disrupting the translational capacity of cells. Yep. Um, I have a, a pretty basic uh, science question, actually. I, I love the um, T7 RNAP evolution for, you know, pushing against double-stranded RNA synthesis. But when you were talking about that, I was thinking, well, why wouldn't you just put RNAs3 into these reactions? I imagine the answer to that is to avoid hairpin cleavage, but then I was curious, actually, why is it necessary to do that, and what is it about the TLR that responds to double-stranded RNA but not the secondary structure of the RNA, and is that something that you have yeah, to think so about? Yeah, so I think the key is how long is that, that duplex, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's, we, the hairpins that are, in our, that are naturally in the RNA are shorter than the ones that trigger the, um, the TLRs and the MyD88 and, and the, the cytoplasmic sensors. So that's the simple answer. Oh, there's a, there, there she's coming. Sorry, the timing of delivery to the public, and were you limited on the drug product stage, getting it into vials, and is there an effort to speed that up? You know, I'm so old, I got vaccinated by vaccine guns, <laughs> right? Guess. A thousand kids in a few hours at my yeah. elementary school. Mm -hmm. Is there is that ever going to come back or something like that? Well, we obviously are very interested in other ways to vaccinate uh, besides a, a needle and syringe. Um, but I, I can't tell you any kind of date at this point when that will change. But yes, certainly. Um, it's really interesting the how vaccines are delivered has changed over time. The original vaccines really were a, um, a little thing that looked like a fork, and they would dip it in the vaccine material and then just poke it into your arm and make a hole in your arm, and that's how they'd get the vaccine in you. So um, the, it's, but there are other, other ways of delivering vaccines, as, as you know, and, and we're, we're trying to see uh, what we can do about that. I thank you for your talk and for your work. I never wanted to uh, have a standing ovation more than that talk and the, <laughs> your company's work. Thank you. Uh, just for maybe it's a question for you or maybe Newbar behind us. Now that you've done this miraculous time to market, of course, people want faster. So if you wanted to chase, you know, the Delta variant or the you know the COVID variants or flu variants, what is the key engineering challenge? You know, what's the bottleneck that could be shortened to improve that, or even what's what what would what's your barrier now to to jump to the next variant? Well, we, we actually, um, and actually if you watch this year's Science Day presentation, so the 2021, we did a whole thing on how we're tracking the variants in, in real time. And um, we are, have been making internally um, variations of the vaccine and testing them to have them ready in case the current vaccine uh, proves no longer effective against a new emerging variant. We haven't seen that yet, but we're, um, making sure that we're ready to go, and I don't personally see any bottlenecks to that. So um, it's it's you know it's just making that corporate decision as to whether or not we're going to switch. Um, as people are exposed to more and more mRNA therapeutics, is there any concern that um, they develop uh, an immune response to something like pseudouridine um, or other ways ah. you found to get around? 
No, I don't think response? so because, well, first of all, pseudouridine is a very common modified nucleotide in your own body. It's contained in lots of tRNAs and ribosomal RNA. 1-methyl pseudou is also a natural uh, nucleotide that's in your tRNAs. And so um, the, the other thing is that it would be very difficult for me to imagine how you would get an immune response to such a, a very small uh, nucleotide. Um, so, you know, it's, it's in your body naturally. I just don't, I don't think that's going to be a, a problem. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, great question. All right. We heard another great example of how uh, we can get chemical and biomolecular engineering concepts into the design of these systems. And uh, we are going to take a break now and enter the last stage of our symposium, at, which starts at 2.35 officially, so I'm going to be calling everyone back to session at 2.30. All right, so more time to uh, enjoy each other's company and ask questions outside. Thank you. Excellent, I see people beginning to return now. I want to thank you for joining us for this session. You know, we started the day by looking at what Danny taught us and how that led to big things. And we just had a talk about how we can use design concepts and engineering concepts for modern medicine. Now we're going to look ahead. What's the future hold? And with that, uh, I'd like to invite up our, net, our moderator, Katie Galloway. Katie is one of our newest faculty in the department, joining the faculty in 2019 after pursuing her graduate studies at Caltech and her postdoc at USC. She holds the Charles and Hilda Roddy Career Development Chair in Chemical Engineering. Her own research combines stem cell biology, systems biology, synthetic biology, and chromatin engineering to explore the molecular regulatory rules of cell fate transitions. It seemed fitting to me to have one of our newest faculty in biochemical engineering leading a discussion about the future of the field, and I'm pleased to introduce her to you today. Please join me in welcoming her. Paula, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, Good afternoon. It's, uh, I'm Katie Galloway, uh, a new professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and it's, a, it's truly a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing our next session, uh, Futures and Frontiers. Um, over the last day uh, for the symposium, we've had the chance to hear the reflections on Danny's legacy, um, of which I am even more deeply appreciative um, for the way that he pioneered work um, that makes it possible for my lab to exist in a chemical engineering department with the, our, our heavy biological focus. Um, and that's something that has uh, just been so clear over the last uh, day and a half. Um, and um, over this time, we've had a chance to hear Danny's legacy from his family, his colleagues, his students, um, and how um, he directly impacted those around him. Today, we've heard how Danny's legacy has reshaped MIT and significantly influenced the convergence of biology and engineering, which he was very passionate about. And um, through different initiatives that began in the early 80s in particular, Danny's vision of an integrating biology and engineering through his collaborations supported and coincided with the development of many important uh, fusions of engineering and biology, uh, including uh, the establishment of the Whitehead, the Broad, the Koch, the formation of the biological engineering department, not surprisingly, his career coincided also with the reshaping of Kendall Square, which is, I think, very evident for all of us who've been trying to walk around and find various buildings here. And thank you, Melissa, for pointing that out. <laughs> um, the area has changed quite a bit, um, and that's a reflection of, I think, the, uh, the legacy of biotechnology in the region. Um, and of course, we've just heard about how biotechnology has now also allowed us to return to a place where we can meet together again uh, through the work of Moderna, and so we're great, very grateful for that. Um, and uh, especially with the news now, um, that's extremely exciting to my family that they have uh, all the way down to five-year-olds that can get vaccinated. This is an extremely wonderful development. And again, uh, this coinciding between uh, biology and uh, engineering to provide for our future. Um, in keeping with this um, uh, memory uh, for Danny of, in terms of innovation in the biotech space, I'm very delighted that we now have uh, several speakers who are at the leading edge of biotech that you'll be hearing from, and they'll be telling us about the future and the frontiers. 
All of our speakers are with companies that are applying innovative science and technology uh, to meet unmet needs. Uh, this is a theme that Danny would have been, uh, that he would have been very enthusiastic about that we're, we're celebrating today, and something he emphasized over his 50 years. They all exemplify the mo MIT motto, Men's at Manus. They all demonstrate the opportunity to bring biology and engineering together, which is, of course, the fundamental tenet of biological, biochemical engineering as Danny taught for five decades. Many of the companies represented here today are building innovative science and technology platforms for advanced therapeutic medical products uh, to address unmet medical needs. Um, Vendata uses my, my, uh, microbial consortia to address multiple diseases. Signal Therapeutics employs six, six platforms uh, to develop therapeutics to multiple diseases uh, via exoneurobiology. Mycardia brings therapeutics to unmet needs in cardiovascular disease. Theradaptive uses material science and biology to uh, uh, for novel therapeutic delivery platform. Uh, Kodiak Bioscience uh, employs exosomes made in cell culture and loaded as innovative drug delivery vehicles to address unmet medical needs. And they use advanced cell culture and continuous bioprocessing and creative downstream processing uh, in a manner that uh, we think that would make Danny smile. Uh, to start with, we're gonna hear from uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, um, which is building a platform based on synthetic biology to drive the design of innovative products to address therapeutic and diagnostic uh, uh, goals and uh, achieve a sustainable society. Um, to begin there, we will be, I will be inviting up, uh, and I would like to invite up uh, Reshma, uh, Reshma Shetty. Um, Reshma did her undergrad work at um, the University of Utah, studying computer science as well as biology. She then came to MIT, where she did her PhD in biological engineering under Tom Knight and Drew Endy, examining how fundamental engineering principles might be best applied to design and construction of engineered biological systems. After graduating from MIT in 2008, she became a co-founder of Ginkgo Bioworks, where she currently serves as president and chief operating officer. Ginkgo Bioworks uses a synthetic biology platform to design microorganisms for a wide range of pharmaceutical and industrial applications and went public in September of this year, and their stock ticker is DNA, um, in keeping with the biotech theme. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Reshma. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction, and many thanks to Chris and Paula for the invitation to be here today. Um, as an MIT alum, it's really an honor to be back on campus. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, Ginkgo and what we do, and in particular, how we leverage what we do to help with COVID-19 pandemic response. Um, our contributions certainly weren't as big as Moderna's, of course, um, but we like to think that we've sort of helped in our own way, as I'm sure many of you have as well. Um, so apparently the lawyers tell me I have to put up a disclaimer slide, um, don't ask me to read it, um, don't even ask me to interpret it for you, but you know, uh, hopefully I don't get in trouble because I put this up. <laughs> Um, so at Ginkgo, um, you know, we started here at MIT over in the Stata Center um, about 13 years ago now, and we started with a mission to make biology easier to engineer, right? Um, and so I'm really grateful to my time at MIT because it showed me that you could think about how to program biology, right? Take engineering ideas, engineering principles, and think about redesigning biology. And so that is what we do every day um, at, at Ginkgo today. Um, and so you can see here our roots. Um, Tom Knight is one of our founders. This is him standing with his um, master's thesis at MIT, um, working on a mini computer uh, um, <laughs> back in 1972. And, um, and, and then there's uh, the rest of the founders in 2006 when we participated in the iGEM competition, um, engineering E. coli to smell like wintergreen and banana. And so you can see this field has um, been around for a while now, um, you know, probably more than 20 years. Um, and we've really come a long way, I think, in, in terms of the developing the foundations for engineering biology. Uh, and I think what's exciting to me right now is that the number of applications um, after, you know, that we can go after using the tools of cell programming, of cell engineering, has really just blossomed, right? So things that were sort of science fiction when I was a PhD student are now actual like, commercial projects that we're working on, right? So we work on things like engineering nitrogen fixation um, with uh, Bayer, the largest ag company in the world. We work on things like, um, uh, you know, environmental remediation with a new spin out that we call Alonia. Um, just um, last week, I had, um, you know, meatballs with a new um, uh, animal protein ingredient that we developed in conjunction with Join. It's 
pretty cool to eat your own products, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and so really the applications are sort of endless. Um, and, and that's really what motivated us to start Ginkgo is to be able to build a platform that allows you to go after all of these different applications, right? But at my core, I'm a tools person, I'm a technologies person, right? I get psyched about the platform that we're building, right? Um, and so that's really what Ginkgo is all about, is building the horizontal platform for engineering cells, right? And so our goal is to support an entire ecosystem of companies, everything from the large multinationals to the two-person um, startup, um, you know, uh, just spinning out of um, MIT, and be able to enable them to achieve their goals using our horizontal platform. But we don't, of course, do that alone. We leverage a, a ton of um, technologies and, and instruments and, and capabilities that are out there. So we partner with companies like Twist and Berkeley Lights to take those technologies and integrate them into our platform for cell programming. Okay? And so this is great. We were working on this. We were super happy. Um, uh, things were trotting along. Um, and, and so typically our projects, let me, before I kind of go on, typically our projects look like this. Our customers come to us. Um, they have a, you know, some problem they might want to solve. They might have some specs on how um, they want their engineered cell to perform. And then we use our platform to essentially develop an engineered cell or what we call a cell program, right, um, uh, to, to meet those specs, right? And so that is what we do day to day, and, and that is what the bulk of our business had been up until just a couple of years ago. Um, but as um, I'm sure it happened with all of you, like everything sort of changed for us um, and in March um, of 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, right? And so to be clear, like, you know, up until that point, um, we had never worked in infectious disease. We didn't have actually any cap capabilities or experience there. Um, but when the pandemic hit, we sort of felt a call to arms, like I'm sure many of you did, of saying, hey, is there anything we can do to help with this unprecedented time, this unprecedented pandemic? And I think that um, you know, desire to help um, stemmed not only from a moral responsibility, but you know, as we saw, like, you know, everybody was talking about this pandemic, right? All of a sudden, you know, the structure of the COVID-19 virus was like on the six o'clock news, right? And the fact that this little virus ground the entire world to a halt was actually really scary to us, right? So as a company that was, that's trying to make biology easier to engineer, the fact that this little virus could actually bring the entire world to a halt, like sort of drove home for us in a very visceral way that if we are going to make a platform for engineering biology, we also have an obligation to build the biosecurity that goes along with that, right? So just like if you're a fintech company, you have to worry about fraud, fraud detection, fraud pre prevention, right? Um, just like if you're an internet company, you worry about cybersecurity. I believe that as a biotechnology company building a platform for cell engineering, we have an obligation to think about the biosecurity that goes along with that, right? And so the, co the combination of this sort of very existential crisis in the world, as well as that obligation to bio build the biosecurity that pairs with our cell engineering platform is what led us to make this sort of, in retrospect, crazy jump to help with the COVID-19, right? Um, again, even though we didn't have any prior experience. And so when we said, okay, how could we help um, with the pandemic response, we sort of basically tried to run a series of experiments. We said, okay, if you know, want to think about pandemic response, there's sort of multiple concentric layers of protection that you might think about, right? So first of all is, of course, vaccines and therapeutics, right? Somebody gets sick, you want to be able to treat them, or you want to be able to prevent them from getting sick in the first place, right? So that's a very obvious place where biology can help with pandemic response, right? But the next layer out is you'd actually like to um, prevent um, and uh, the spread of the pandemic, right? So you'd like to be able to test people even before you know that they're symptomatic to know if they're sick or not and to prevent the spread, right? Choke off um, any hotspots, right? And so that's what we call intercept, right? So basically intercepting the virus before it can spread. And then in the outermost layer, which I won't have time to talk about today, we think about biosurveillance, like how do you just know if a new virus is coming, right? How do you, could we have detected the Delta variant before it hit the US? And there are a whole set of tools around biosurveillance that we're also working on and investing in, but that again, I won't have time to chat about today. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we actually launched projects um, in and around vaccines and therapeutics. I'm gonna talk about one of them uh, today. Um, and in particular, so it was, it was 2020, right? Um, Pfizer um, and Moderna had their 
um, clinical trials going along, a lot of interest in MRI vaccines and whether they might provide a way out of the pandemic, but we didn't know if they were gonna work, right? But what we said is like, hmm, if, if mRNA vaccines actually pan out, right, and obviously they did, but if they pan out, we gotta actually make enough, right, to give to every person in the US and ultimately every person in the world, right? Um, and you, you started to see a series of articles that came out that talked about, hey, like act, the supply chain for providing, for manufacturing and delivering vaccines to every person in the world is actually a huge challenge, right? Um, so yeah, we needed to actually develop the vaccine, but actually getting doses into arms is almost equally or bigger challenge, right? And so, and in particular with mRNA vaccines, we had never really made them at that scale before, right? This is a new technology, a new vaccine modality. And so while we knew a lot about mRNA vaccines and how they worked, we hadn't actually scaled them up for large scale manufacture before, right? And so we started looking into like, what does the manufacturing process of mRNA vaccines look like, right? And we realized that actually there were some critical reagents that you need to make um, mRNA vaccines that up until that point had just been sort of like used as for like research grade, like um, uh, scientific uh, research, right? So in particular with some mRNA, mRNA vaccines, you need um, mRNA maturation enzymes. So things like vaccinia capping enzyme and an, um, and an OMT and methyltransferase to help um, in the uh, final like production of, the, of mRNA vaccines. Right? And when we went and looked at sort of the current production levels of these enzymes, they're actually like a few migs right, per liter. Like it's, it's crazy low. They're actually like really efficient. And that's totally fine if you're just trying to get enough for like doing a little bit of research in your lab. It's not okay if you want to be able to make enough to supply the entire world with an mRNA vaccine. Right? Um, and so we said, hmm, could we help? Because right? it turns out like these are enzymes that are actually made in like bacterial cells. Right? So like this is the work that Ginkgo had been working on, like that kind of work for a long time now. So we had actually built up a lot of infrastructure to be really good at engineering strains and being able to produce proteins from them and being able to optimize the fermentation process, et cetera. And of course, time was of the essence. And so we actually launched an internal project to see if we could improve the titers of one of these enzymes, vaccinia capping enzyme, right? And so essentially, we, uh, one of our program teams um, at Ginkgo basically designed a library. And they said, well, OK, again, mRNA vaccines hadn't been like, approved at that point, right? But they said, well, we know this enzyme is used in nucleic acid vaccine manufacturing. We probably, probably we don't want to be mucking with the sequence of this enzyme because it's probably already been approved. It's going to already be in clinical trials. And so nobody's going to want to change the sequence. But what we can do is change everything around that enzyme sequence and try to optimize its production. And so essentially we built more than a 300 member expression library where we sort of varied promoters, right, with some binding sites, tags um, on the two subunits, um, even the plasma backbone, and just built a big library around vaccinia capping enzyme. Now this is like SynBio 101, right? Like we've been doing this for years, but all of a sudden being able to do this fast and in time to deliver a key result um, to the world um, that needs to be able to be vaccinated using these mRNA vaccines seemed super, super important, right? And so we actually built this library. We screened them in uh, microtiter plates um, uh, using E. coli lysates and saw about a five-fold increase in, in production of this enzyme just with that sort of initial screen. Um, we then knew, well, we got to be able to have a fermentation process that wraps around this. Again, fermentation optimization is something we do at Ginkgo regularly as part of our cell programming platform. And so we took um, our best performing strains, took them into these little fermenters. This is the um, Sartorius Amber 250 system. It's an amazing fermentation system um, where you can t basically test out either 12 or 24 um, strains at a time or 12 to 24 different uh, fermentation conditions at a time. Again, really nice for being able to do design of um, design of experiment style optimization experiments. And so we basically took the best performing strains and ran them through cycles of DOE optimization and were able to push up the performance of the strain another couple fold to about 10x over what had been reported in the past, right? Um, and so then we took that and said, huh, well, okay, it's great, it works at lab scale. Can we actually take this to somebody who can manufacture this at commercial scale? We don't have commercial scale fermentation facilities at Ginkgo. And so we went to Aldevron, which actually already uh, is a producer of Xenia capping enzyme, and we said, hey, like, we have this better process, we have this better strain, we think this would be a great way to actually be able to increase the uh, volume of production. 
And so we actually had to tweak our process a little bit more to be able to work in all Devron's fermenters. Um, but by and large, we were able to then tech transfer that process over to Aldevron, and they were able to show that they too saw a 10x increase in titer in their facilities. Again, not something that always happens, right? It's, it's in bio sort of notorious for having scale-up challenges or having tech transfer challenges, but this one actually worked when we needed it too, and so Aldevron was able to confirm the performance we saw at the lab scale in their 200 liter scale, and they're, and they're in the process of going up from there. Um, and so this is, a, this is, to me, like a really great, amazing story of how these investments we've been making in synthetic biology for the past 20 years around developing the tools and technologies for you know, building DNA, designing DNA, putting it into cells, screen, screening them in microtiter plates, screening them in fermentation conditions. You know, that was capabilities that a lot of people sort of dismissed and, and, and laughed at for a long time, but actually was exactly what we needed at this point in time in the world, right, because of this existential crisis around the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we were, we were excited to be able to announce this kind of breakthrough in manufacturing with Aldevron, and, and, and we're taking it further from there. Okay, so that was our sort of little contribution to the vaccines world. Um, but we've also been working on sort of the intercept layer, so public health testing. And in particular, there was a lot of folks in this country who were really focused on clinical testing and diagnostics. And obviously, if somebody gets sick you, and they have flu-like symptoms, you want to know if they have COVID or not. But the question we wanted to know is, could you actually use testing as a tool to prevent spread? So could you test everybody whether they're sick or not? And obviously the Broad Institute here has been amazing pioneers in this, right? They have basically single-handedly supported the entire New England community and, and helped reopen colleges and now are helping to reopen schools. But we also wanted to do our part. And in particular, the area that got, uh, that sort of garnered a lot of interest from us was when President Biden sort of announced this plan to be able to invest in K through 12 testing to help reopen schools. I have two kids, seven and three. It was a nightmare when they were home, right? Um, I have to say. Um, and so like, we have a lot of moms at Ginkgo and our moms were motivated to get their kids back in school, I'm gonna say. Um, and so, you know, and so even actually before this guidance came out, we were sort of thinking about how could we use testing to help reopen public schools, right? How could we reopen K through 12 schools? And so, you know, back in, De um, in December of 2020, we started think uh, we, we had been thinking about this actually already for a while, but we started doing the math on like, how would you actually test every K through 12 student in the country, right? And so there's roughly 60 million students. If you were testing everybody once a week, you need about 12 million tests a day. And at least at the time, the, the total capacity for PCR testing in the country was around 2 million. So we were off by about an order of magnitude if you wanna be able to test every kid in America. And so we're like, oh my gosh, how do you actually solve this, right? <laughs> um, um, and so we're like, okay, well, we are good at automating um, molecular biology workflows and COVID-19 testing is basically just a PCR, it's an RNA extraction and a PCR test. We can do that. And so we actually did a whole big investment through, this was actually even before December 2020, through most of 2020, we were working on developing COVID-19 testing at Ginkgo, right? And so we developed a very nice NGS assay that had a very nice correlation between the results from our NGS assay and sort of gold standard PCR tests. And, and so we were very proud of ourselves and we're like, great, we're gonna use this. But then we realized that like this was not the problem that needed to be solved to reopen schools. Like we didn't, we actually didn't need more testing capacity. What we needed to do is be smarter about how we were doing the testing, right? Um, and so what we realized is that instead of testing every kid in America, what we should do is test every classroom in America, right? And so we should get, take every kid and have them all test at once, test the entire classroom at once, right? It's called pooled testing or what we call classroom pool testing, where you swab every kid in the classroom, they all put their swabs in a, in a common pool, and you test the entire classroom once. So all of a sudden, instead of needing 60 million tests every week, you need basically drop that by a factor of 20 to 25, right? The average classroom size in America. Right? And so what's normally a, like $100 or $150 test per person becomes $100 or $150 test per classroom. Right? And this was the insight that we needed to actually be able to crack the nut on how do you do large scale K through 12 testing. And so we, we said, okay, so we're gonna collect samples from every kid, we're gonna pool them in, in a single pool, we'll re, re, 
spend them back in the lab and put them through our COVID-19 test, okay? And so we actually validated this. So we looked at, we created like uh, pooled samples with low amounts of virus, pooled samples with higher amount of virus, so that we could actually get very reliable results, even if when you pool 25 fold, or actually in these results, I think this is actually 35 swabs. So you can even go up to 35 swabs in a single sample and still detect COVID-19, even if you have low amounts of virus, like as low as 1,500 copies per mil. You still get pretty good um, uh, sensitivity in the test. And so we're like, this is great. And so we had to actually try it out. And in one of the crazier moments in my life, we decided to test this out at my daughter's school. So we went to my daughter's first grade classroom. Um, the principal there, uh, Dr. Sivian, was gracious enough to like, let us try this out. And this is Dan Rosman from our team here with all these first graders. That's my daughter there getting swabbed. We swabbed the entire classroom, put it in a pool, took the samples back over to Ginkgo and tested them, right? And it worked, like, like shocker upon shocker. We even had, like, the kids were so excited to be part of pandemic response that there was actually one little girl who started sobbing because her parents hadn't signed the consent and so she couldn't participate in the pool testing and she was so sad that she didn't get to participate in this activity that was happening in the classroom. And so we said, wow, this is amazing. This might actually work, right? And so we said, Okay, well, our goal is actually testing every school in America. How are we going to make that happen, right? We're kind of an ambitious company, and so we, we kind of trying to think big. But we realized that it was crazy to think that we were going to test every classroom in America and send all those samples back to Boston to be tested in our lab. Broads actually kind of managed to pull it off, but like for us, like we realized like that was actually crazy. But what we could instead do is be a qualification layer across on labs across the country, right? Because at the end of the day, this is just a PCR test. And we actually, by this point, you know, when January sort of rolled around, January of, um, of this year, like we had actually a reasonable amount of testing. And if you're doing pool testing, we actually had enough capacity, right? Because people were getting vaccinated, which means demand for testing was going down, which means we actually had available capacity amongst all the existing COVID testing labs across the country. And so what we instead did was realize we couldn't solve this with technology. We could actually just solve this by a qualification layer where we send pools, blinded pooled samples to partner labs around the country. We check that their test actually works on pooled samples. And if they do, they become part of our lab network and we can use them to test their local school districts, right? And labs fell all over over themselves to participate because they were like, hey, can I be part of the solution to opening K through 12 schools in my city, in my state? They wanted to do this, right? And so we actually ended up testing, this is example data from Northeastern here, um, where we went through a pretty exhaustive validation with them and showed, yeah, like Northeastern's tests that they had individually, that they had developed on their own for individual samples, also worked on pool test samples, just like ours did, right? And so it was great. We did a pretty exhaustive validation. The Massachusetts uh, Department of Public Health um, sort of put us through our paces. We were really happy about that. Northeastern's test could actually detect as low as 250 copies per mil of the virus, right? Um, and so it was great. We validated them and we started using them first for testing Massachusetts and now they're actually testing almost everybody in the state, a bunch of kids in the state of Maine. And we actually now have partner labs all around the country that we've qualified with this approach. Right? And we're actually now providing testing across about 10 states um, across America. And so this has just been really heartwarming for me as a parent to be able to be part of the solution to help bring kids back to school, because I truly believe that kids are better off in school. <laughs> okay, well, so with that, I'll just say thank you. Um, and, and again, thank you for the invitation to be here. <laughs> I, I think we have time for, for questions. Are there any questions? Um, if, if not, I have a question. Or actually, is there a question right here? Uh, so with, your, with the testing capacity that you've developed, is it possible to track things beyond COVID? Um, is that something you guys are looking at since you're doing NGS? I'm kind of curious, what else could you be looking at? Yeah, so actually, um, so so actually, there's sufficient testing capacity that we've actually repurposed our own internal ca uh, capacity to other cell programming things, just because there's plenty of other COVID testing capacity in the country. But we have been working with folks first on sequencing, so actually deploying testing at airports and being able to sequence positives um, from airports so that you could actually monitor the, the emergence of new variants. Um, and so that's really exciting. We're just piloting that in a few airports right now, um, but would love to see that go broader so we actually have like more of a, like a genomic surveillance network in this country. Um, but I think, you know, um, Thermo and folks are coming out with combo like COVID and flu tests and things like that. And so I, t in my mind, there's no reason why you couldn't use this exact same approach for testing for flu or anything else that you can detect with a PCR test. Thank you. That's very cool. Uh, we have one here back. Uh, actually, uh, 
We'll go distance, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Great, great talk and great story. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on any experiences that you had working with um, government and school districts, maybe outside of Massachusetts, and how, how much that was fundamental to making this a successful model. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. Um, you know, public health in this country is not really controlled at the national level. It's controlled by the individual states and, and more specifically their public health departments. And even the public health departments are really serving as advisors to the schools. So ultimately, most of these testing programs, while they're being funded by, uh, by, by the federal government, the decisions about whether to test in schools is being made either at the state level or even at the sort of city or school district level. Um, and so it's been a sort of fascinating journey to sort of talk to um, uh, these schools um, about um, testing and sort of the pros and cons um, in their um, thing. And you know, we're testing across a variety of states, right? So states with Republican go governors, states with Democratic governors, you know, the whole sort of gamut in between. And so. It's certainly been a fascinating uh, journey, I would say. Um, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of parents really love the idea of the re reassurance that their kids don't have COVID every week, right? And because with pool testing, like log the logistics of it are just way simpler than individual testing, right? It takes like five to seven minutes to do a classroom, right? Like we sort of worked out the procedure. Kids, they know how to swab themselves. We've got kids making YouTube videos about swabbing themselves. Like it's become a whole thing um, and it's just been amazing. And I think what's really, I think it's, it's sort of been an empowering thing for teachers and for students to basically say, I'm not just a victim here. I can actually be part of the solution. Um, and you know, it, it's been interesting, like we, for example, do testing in Baltimore, right? Um, and you know, Baltimore, um, you know, it's a, a population that hasn't always been treated well by, by the healthcare system, right? And so the fact that it's pooled testing, that it's not tied to an individual was actually really appealing to them, right? If you think about like health disparities and how people are treated by me the medical system and stuff. So like a pooled testing approach was actually where we, like, because we don't collect information on the students unless the state requires us to. And so we can sort of just do this, like all we get is like, this is a barcode and this is like teacher X's classroom. They don't even have to send us that, they can even just send us a code. And so that's also been a really appealing part of the design of this is, is the fact that this is not Big Brother necessarily monitoring you. We can actually keep it like de-identified. And we have one more question here. Thank you for that super exciting um, talk. And I, I love, I think it was your second or third slide when you said all the areas you're working on is pretty much everything important on the planet, which I uh, wish I appreciate. Uh, in, in your second box, as we were also talking about the environmental um, before, um, for, the, for the COVID, for example, you had the, the concentric rings. And I was thinking about PFOS, which is obviously a very hot uh, topic right now. Do you, do you imagine also kind of a concentric rings where you're looking at detection, concentration, and breakdown, and utilization? So do you also see it as this holistic um, problem where you can come in at different different um, parts and try to figure out how you can maximize the input? Uh, the yeah, impact? I think absolutely, yeah. I mean, because like one, solu like one point solution is rarely enough for these types of complicated problems, right? So you really need this sort of layered solution. And so like with environmental um, issues, like you wanna be able to detect the contaminants in the environment, you wanna be able to remediate it from the environment one way or another, but you also then wanna be able to go to the source of how we manufacture things in this world and actually change how we manufacture them, right? And I don't think any one of those alone is gonna solve the magnitude of problems we have, right? We really need a combination of all of those. And then it, it's been interesting learnings from, from the COVID-19 response about how they can actually feed into each other and help and reinforce each other. <laughs> All right, what a lovely talk. Thank you so much, Reshma. Um, with that, we're next gonna, uh, I'm gonna be able to invite up uh, Bernard uh, Ole. Uh, he did his under, uh, from, uh, he's the CEO and co-founder from Vendanta uh, Biosciences. He did his undergraduate res uh, studies at the University of uh, Rovira in Iver, oh, I should have read this before, uh, virtually in Spain before coming to the US for his graduate studies in chemical engineering. Um, Bernard's thesis uh, was co-advised by Danny as well as Alan Hatton and examines mechanistic modeling of increased oxygen transport using functionalized magnetic fields in bioreactors. 
He received his PhD in 2007. While at MIT, he also completed the practice school doing station work at Mitsubishi Chemical Company in Japan and received his MBA uh, from MIT Sloan. Murat is the CEO and co-founder of Vendanta Biosciences, which is developing a new class of drugs to modulate uh, the human uh, uh, microbiome. Their clinical stage pipeline offers uh, product candidates uh, that are being evaluated for the treatment of high-risk uh, C. diff infection, inflammatory bowel diseases, and advanced or metastatic cancers, food allergy, and liver disease. Uh, please join me in welcoming Bernat. So I, I was supposed to be Danny's last student until he changed his mind. And then David McLean was supposed to be his last, his last student. And, and then Danny changed his mind again. And then Raga was supposed to be. And so you, you, you kind of see where this is going. He just didn't want, didn't want to retire. Um, after school, I, I worked in venture creation for some time. And I became very interested in the, in the human microbiome field. This is a field that uh, in the early 2000s was not really in the radar. But around 07, the NIH started the Human Microbiome Project on the heels of the Human Genome Project to use all these sequencing capability to learn new things. And as a result, there was an avalanche of disciplines and departments that brought new knowledge that helped us understand that the community of microbes that live in people, especially in the intestine, play very important roles in health. They are very important to how we resist infection. Uh, they're very important to train the immune system. And uh, in that background, I became very interested in the field. And I started a project that ultimately became Vedanta. We're, we're a company based in Cambridge that's developing drugs that are based on the fine consortia of bacteria. And the reason we're using consortia, or, or why consortia, is that in nature, uh, in all ecosystems, function is usually distributed ag around communities of organisms. Division of labor among different species of organisms uh, allows them to perform complex functions that individual organisms cannot perform. In the human body, some of the most obvious examples, such as the production of secondary bile acids, which are very important in immune responses, or short-chain fatty acids are rarely ever the product of one organism doing all the magic, but rather communities working together. That's why we use consortium. Here you can see some example of, of our work in, um, in immunomodulation, where our candidate that uh, we're using in patients now for ulcerative colitis, which is a, a consortium of 16 different strains, is far superior to any individual strain uh, shaping the immune response that we're trying to modulate in humans, which in this case is inducing regulatory T cells. This type of phenomenon you see over and over in the microbiome field. It's rarely ever the case that one strain can saturate a phenotype. You need communities. And then the second word in our modality is defined consortia. And what we mean by defined is that these are products made from clonal cell banks by good old fermentation, rather than by taking fecal material from people and giving it to patients. And we think, I think this is where the microbiome field is gonna go. It's not where it started, but this is where I think it's gonna go for a number of reasons. And I'll, I'll touch on those in, in a second, but before I, I get into, into those, uh, just a, a very quick explanation of how the drugs work. What the patient takes is a capsule that has lyophilized powder inside with equal, equal amounts of each of the different species of bacteria that make up the consortia, each of which is produced by fermentation. The capsule travels down the intestine, opens up, releases the bacteria, and then these bacteria colonize the host and they start multiplying. And in that sense, they're fundamentally different from all the drugs that exist today in that they proliferate in that compartment and they may stay in people for a very long period of time. They may stay in you for a year or for longer. By simply colonizing, if you pick the right bacteria, they can exclude other bacteria from occupying those same niches. And many of, of those other bacteria tend to be pathogens that are undesirable in the gut. I'll give an example of one of those today in C. difficile. But also, via the intestine, they can shape immune responses. The majority of, of the cells of our immune system are in the intestine at any given point in time. More than 80% of the cells in your body 
are in the intestine. And the reason they're there is because they have to patrol these communities of bacteria, a few of which are up to no good, and treat them very differently than the rest of the bacteria that are there for good. And that's actually a very complicated job that the immune system has to do. And something that we try to leverage by developing drugs that are made of the bacteria that shape the immune responses that we want. For example, tolerance, which could be useful to an autoimmune disease patient. The reason why I think defined uh, products are the way to go um, brings me back to the work that many of us did with Danny. If you start at the bottom of this slide, I'm drawing an analogy between the plasma field uh, with the microbiome field on the, on the top of the slide. Um, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, plasma fractionation to, to get albumin for, for septic shock patients and then factor eight for hemophiliacs and then IVIG for a range of um, idiopathies uh, was the only option for biologics for many patients until the work of Danny and many of you here made it possible to make proteins from cell banks. And that completely changed the game because with the, with the previous approach, uh, the composition of what the patient got was always different. You never get the same drug twice. It was a very variable composition. There was a risk of pathogen contamination and transfer from donors, which in the 80s and the 90s hit home with the HIV pandemic and then Hep C. And the, the supply was and still is highly unreliable. You need donors to show up at donation centers, which they don't like to do during pandemics. And it doesn't scale with economies. If every donation is one drug, you don't get to put it into a fermenter and make 2,000 doses in one go. Every effort uh, is, is um, uh, every donation is, is basically one, uh, one treatment, which means that the cost of goods are very much not in your favor. In the microbiome field, I think we're seeing something similar at the top. We started in the field with fecal microbiota transplants and variants of that approach, like for example, giving spore fractions that, that other companies of, of alumni of our lab have pioneered. And with these approaches, we have similar issues. Every capsule has a different composition. There's a risk of pathogen contamination. It's already happened in the field with, with deaths of, of, uh, from FMT contaminated with, with E. coli. And the supply is very complicated with high cost of goods. What we're trying to do with Vedanta is what many of us have worked on uh, in biologics in, in the field before, which is try to turn this into a process that obviates the need for a donor. By making our products from cell banks, we can have the certainty that every capsule has the exact same composition, which means that there shouldn't be product to product variability. And that should have implications to the reproducibility of clinical trial results. We eliminate the risk of transferring pathogens that come from a donor altogether because there is no donor. And we now have a process that has true economies of scale. You can take your 20 liter fermentation and bring it to thousands of liters with technologies that have been around for a while uh, and make a product that's gonna get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as you, as you gain scale. And so as, as sort of like two evidences of the potential of the approach, we've partnered with the two parties that care the most about scale. The Gates Foundation, which wants to be able to bring this to the developing world at large volumes with very little cost, and the US government with BARDA that wants to be able to stockpile these types of drugs for national security uses um, and mass. Uh, this is a quick explanation of how we go about picking the bacteria. Of course, if instead of giving fecal material, we make specific choices of bacteria that the, that the drug will be made of, you have to have a criteria for how you make these decisions. We start with data from human interventional studies. We sponsor studies where uh, clinicians want to give fecal transplantation to their patients and get access to all the fecal samples that come from those studies. We sequence all the information in those samples and we ask largely one question, which is, are there bacteria that go from a donor to recipient and associate with clinical response when you compare the responders versus the non-responders? And we don't do that because we have any interest in commercializing fecal transplantation procedures, which we don't, but because it's a great learning tool directly in humans. Once we have these hypotheses, which is in essence an association, then we can ask in step number two, is there actually causation that underlies what we observed in humans? So here we can go into animals and do systematic experiments where we either remove or reintroduce the community of bacteria in an animal and know and observe if a phenotype goes away and comes back, which is the cleanest proof of causation. Now you know that the microbiome is driving that response. And then we can start top-down ap approaches where we remove groups of bacteria one at a time until the phenotype that we observed disappeared. 
And when that happens, you know that we just, just remove, removed is actually essential rather than dispensable. Even then, once we know generally what types of bacteria may be relevant, uh, there are thousands of strains of bacteria that you could pick from with different properties when it comes to safety and pharmacology. So in step number three, what we've done is we've created what we believe is the largest library of gut bacteria in the world, where we've gotten fecal samples from people in four different continents, brought them to Cambridge, and isolated every possible bacterial strain that we could from, from those samples. With that, we've created a library of about 100,000 100, isolates uh, by using an aerobic culturing technique inside of uh, oxygen-free chambers, where typically a donation that has many different clones is used, is picked with robotic systems and put into research cell banks that are now pure clones, not stool anymore. And once you have those, those cell banks, you can, you can treat them as you would treat a library of small molecules. We arrange them into uh, libraries of 96 wild plates where in each plate there is one bacteria. And now you can interrogate tens of thousands of bacteria at a time for safety and pharmacological properties that would be inaccessible in lower throughput systems like animal models. With that, now we have a good scorecard of the properties of the bacteria, and we need to go back to animals to study them as communities in an in vivo setting. And we've also developed tools to be able to co culture those organisms together so that you can study a community as opposed to studying just the individual organisms because their properties change when you put them with their friends or with their enemies. Uh, at this point, we're not done. We may have a, a, a drug declared when it works in animal models, but we still have to make it. And the manufacturing of the fine consortia is complicated. You have multiple active ingredients. Uh, our most complex drug today has 16 different bacteria. Uh, each of them has to be cell banked, fermented, separated, uh, lyophilized, and each of those steps may sound very obvious for E. coli, and they're sure not obvious for the multiplicity of anaerobes, very finicky some of them, that live in the, in the human intestine. There's a lot of know-how know and process development that goes into making them. And then we have to put them in, in humans and get them to work. Uh, this is sort of, sort of like a, a tip of the hat to the manufacturing work that we've done in, in, the, in the spirit of the things that Danny liked. Uh, we've been the first company to show that you can make a lyophilized GMP grade defined consortium, consortium drug and put it into the clinic. And we've now done, done that for, uh, for five different candidates that are in the clinic, uh, over 200 GMP runs, and, and grown uh, almost 3,000 different bacterial species that are anaerobes in a GMP setting. And the way we do that is uh, we start with master cell banks. There's no donor, no fecal material. Uh, those uh, are expanded uh, to create an inoculum for a fermentation process. Um, the fermentations are done largely with disposable systems so that we can operate a multi-product facility uh, and uh, clean it up um, easily. After the fermentation, in the third video, you see the lyophilization step. You need to be able to take this bacteria and remove the water from the inside the cytopl cytoplasm without blowing up the membrane, which um, is a very tricky process because it's very easy to kill the bacteria. And if you kill the bacteria, the drug doesn't work. And they have to be alive. And then in the last step, we turn this liquid fermented bacteria that's been lyophilized uh, and turn into a, into a uh, dry powder into, this is what a lyophilized cake typically looks like, into powder that's what ultimately goes into the capsules that patients end up getting. So the, the drug actually looks like any other drug, uh, but of course, these are uh, live dormant bacteria that once they reach your intestine, can wake up and, um, and go back to being active. Um, with our scientific founders, we've done uh, plenty of work to systematically identify different groups of bacteria that have properties that could be therapeutically useful. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the work that we've done to identify bacteria that provide resistance against other pathogens. Um, but other programs in our pipeline that I will not cover today are based on the work that we've done to identify bacteria in the intestine that induce immunoregulatory, immunoregulatory responses. And in this series of papers, we've explained how to develop these bacteria, how to find these bacteria and some of their molecular and cellular mechanisms, as well as bacteria that do the opposite, that promote uh, immune enhancing responses that could be useful in the context of cancer or vaccination. Uh, and so the, I will now give you one example of how we've done the process that I just described and brought it to people with, with very interesting results that we announced just a few weeks ago. And the example is in infection control. Today, um, there's a, a number of, of uh, vulnerable hospitalized populations that uh, have a commonality 
of being at very high risk for microbiome-related issues. Patients that are 65 years and older, have been in the ICU, have liver disease, kidney disease, have received bone marrow transplants. By definition, those are compromised patients that are more likely to get in trouble for anything in a hospital. For many of those procedures in, in their treatment uh, in the oncology wards or, or in the liver disease uh, units of hospitals, they will receive high, high doses of broad spectrum antibiotics like cephalosporins and quinolones, which are very effective at wiping out the diversity of bacteria that live in the gut. And when that happens, when the combination of those two things happens together, an immunocompromised patient with the use of a broad spectrum antibiotic, that is trouble. Because these patients have their microbiota completely decimated. That's the natural resistance against pathogens. So anything they pick in the hospital or that they already carry in their, in their gut has an outsized opportunity now to take over. And C. difficile is sort of the poster child of these types of problems. You make it very easy for the rods to take over. And once they take over, they're very hardy because they form spores, and they're not easy to kill with, with, uh, with antibiotics. And so what we're trying to do is what we show in the right, which is not to replace antibiotics. The, the use of antibiotics is here to stay. Oncologists, infectious disease dogs, they, use, they need to use these, these drugs. Um, and that's going to stay here. What we're trying to do is deal with some of the collateral damage that they leave behind, right? And the opportunity here is that immediately after a patient has received the antibiotic that they need and their microbiota is now decimated and vulnerable and susceptible to infection, come in as soon as we can and reintroduce bacteria that we think can help reconstitute the resistance against pathogens. And this is not just a problem that relates to C. difficile. Any gram-negative infection with enterobacteria fits in the same category. At the molecular level, what's happening in the intestine of these patients is what's shown on the, on the left. Antibiotics like cephalosporins bring down the density of bacteria in the, in the gut dramatically, and they kill a lot of the firmicutes and bacteroidetes that are the populations of bacteria that typically dominate the healthy gut. And the ones that take over, which are shown here in red, usually are the ones that are the bacteria that are up to no good. At the molecular level, some of the good bacteria that are shown here in yellow, blue, uh, and green are doing transformations of dietary or host products, like fiber from your diet or bile acids from your intestine, into molecules like short-chain fatty acids, which help strengthen the integrity of the gut barrier, which is being damaged by the toxins from C. diff, or secondary bile acids, which are directly toxic to C. difficile, which help keep the pathogen in check. So this is mechanistically what we're trying to get our microbes to do. So now, enough with the abstract. This is the actual data of how we got to the candidate, and, and then I'll show you some of the clinical results. Uh, per, per the process that I had described before, uh, we relied on human data from interventional studies of patients that were being treated with fecal transplants to learn about which bacteria may be important. And the data that you see on the left is in human interventional hypothesis generation. So these are 70-something uh, patients in the Netherlands that are being treated with fecal transplants for CDV infection. Uh, and the way to read this chart is every row is a genera of bacteria. Every column is, in this bucket, a patient that has C. diff during active disease. In this bucket, a patient that has been recovered from the C. diff after a successful fecal transplant. And to the right, all the healthy donors that provided the fecal transplant. And what you can see without having to do any math is that there's a group of bacteria that C. diff patients have that healthy donors or cure patients don't have. Those tend to be a lot of the problematic gram negatives and gram positives. And there's a group of bacteria that healthy donors have, that recovered patients have, but that active disease patients have completely decimated. And so we, we derive V303, our drug, from the general bacteria that have the strongest association with recovery in the clinic. We then did work in vitro and in vivo to verify that this was not just a lucky association, but it was actually underlied by causation. With the screening methods that I showed before, we were able to go through lots of strains of bacteria and found some that were directly very effective in inhibiting the growth of C. difficile, and those, some of those were introduced into the, into the composition. Uh, and here I'm, I'm cutting through a lot of steps, but ultimately we tried many different consortia in models of C. difficile infection, mouse models, where typically the mice quickly die after they're in, exposed to an antibiotic followed by C. difficile infection. And we use as a control a human fecal transplant, which in the clinic works very well. And basically, we kept trying consortia empirically until we found one that worked equally well or better than a human fecal transplant, which ended up being V303, 
a consortium of just eight bacteria that was sufficient to match that threshold. We tried consortia that were smaller and they didn't work as well. We tried consortia that were bigger and some of them worked as well, but the manufacturing would have been more complicated for no, for no added benefit. So that's, that's where we stopped. Uh, this, day, this slide has a wealth of information of our first clinical study that we did in healthy volunteers. We were putting this modality into patients uh, for the first time and we had to learn how do you pick the right dose of a drug that's based on live bacteria. And so we did a study where we tried uh, escalating single doses and multiple doses with and without an antibiotic pretreatment. The design is shown up here. And, then, and first we measured, measured the pharmacokinetics of the drug. How well does the drug colonize? How robustly, how prevalently, how durably? And the, the figure in the bottom has a wealth of information um, about how these microbia, how bacteria behave inside of humans. Here, the way to read that is, the, the way to read that is each panel is a different patient. Um, each color row is one of the strains in V303. There's eight of them. And the x-axis is time going out to week 52, so that's one year. Um, these are fecal samples from patients that we sequence the, the bacterial DNA from to figure out how much of the bacteria colonizes. The size of the, of the circles tells you how, much, how abundant the colonization is, and the presence of the, the circles that the bacteria colonize at all. And what you can quickly see is that there's this beautiful robustness of colonization where despite the variability of their microbiomes to begin with, we're finding conditions, if you pick the right dose level, the right dose regimen after an antibiotic pretreatment, that get most of the strains in in most of the people most of the time and for a duration that can last for almost a year after they, get, they got the last dose. And that's how far we looked at. Some of these patients probably stay colonized after that. So with this study, we picked the dose that we thought would work the best. And we learned that you know, multiple doses work much better than single doses, uh, and that doing this after an antibiotic pretreatment gives you much better colonization than without, because the antibiotic, ironically, lowers the density of bacteria and makes it a lot easier for you to colonize. And then we also look at the pharmacodynamics of the drug. Uh, how effective is it at recovering the community of bacteria that was in these patients, which is what we're trying to do therapeutically. And the way to read this chart is, this is what the community looks at baseline in blue. When you do an antibiotic pretreatment, which is what these patients have received in the clinic, um, that damages their, their community. And as we, as we give bigger and bigger dose exposures with our drug, we can bring this back to what it looked like at baseline. We can bring that microbial community closer to what a healthy community looks like. So there's a dose exposure dependent PKPD relationship on how the drug works. And now finally, we've put that into patients. Uh, we just announced a few weeks ago the results of our phase two study. This study was done in C. difficile patients that um, had any number of recurrences. They had finished a course of antibiotics and they were either put on high dose V303 or low dose V303 versus placebo. The primary endpoint of the study was measuring the proportion of patients that recurred with their infection after eight weeks. And what we found uh, is what appeared to be best in class efficacy results in the field from all the therapies that have been tested with a absolute risk reduction of almost 32 points. That means that if you're in the high dose only 13 point something of the patients recur while on placebo is more like 45%. This corresponds to an odds ratio of 0.19, which means that you have more than an 80% reduction of the risk that you will experience an infection. Uh, highly statistically significant, corresponding to a number needed to treat of three, which means that for every three patients that we treated, we prevented one recurrence. A number needed to treat of 10 is considered very good for a drug. Uh, a number needed to treat of, of three is really a really nice result to get because you know you're now going into phase three with, with something that's, that has a good chance of working. And so um, I'll, I'll close with that. Uh, besides our, our, our work with CNC difficile, we are also uh, working um, in inflammatory bowel disease where we plan to start a phase two study in the next few months in ulcerative colitis patients, uh, in oncology, in gram-negative infections, and also we have uh, clinical studies going on in liver disease and in food allergy. And uh, rather than closing with, with a boring pipelines line, uh, I, I wanted to close with a call to action to the, to the chemi department. The, uh, the work that I've described today, some of the biggest problems in our, in our field are problems that, that can be solved. 
by chemical engineers in manufacturing, but in discovery also. Uh, discovering these new class of drugs based on ecosystems of bacteria, uh, the, the, the secret sauce here is not to, to clone a receptor or to find one molecule that distills the essence of what the community does. That's, that's not how any of this works. You, um, you have to find communities of bacteria, and what we're trying to do is a lot more like predicting the weather. It's a very complex system that has emergent properties. And um, I guess I have two questions for the department. The first one is, isn't that exactly the type of problem that chemical engineers should be solving, right? Figuring out how you can use computational methods and bacterial culturing techniques to discover and manufacture new compositions. Uh, and, and two, um, what the hell is the chemistry department doing at MIT not getting into this area? If, if Danny was around and, and if he was the man he was 20 years ago with that energy, he'd take a flamethrower to this place <laughs> for not going into this area. So I hope that, you know, helps uh, uh, the department uh, take a look at that because I, now, now more seriously, I think this is an area where chemical engineers can come in and make uh, a huge difference. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, do we, uh, oh yes, we have a question. Here we go. Hi, uh, I'm Lindsay Griffith. I am in a biology here at MIT, and I'm curious, I, all, I actually work with the whole team of the in natural immunology, where we have a colon mucosal barrier that we all share to be co-cultural and fecal bacteria and prostitutes. So we're actually at MIT very actively involved in building humanized and vitro models, because a lot of the diseases like, um, processes, et cetera, it's really hard to study in animals. And we published a paper, in, uh, one paper on this, and a lot of stuff is in the pipeline and lab, because the human immune system is so different from the mouse, the diet, the biomass, all of that. So where do you see in your um, whole product development and, and discovery a role for more humanized models that let you look at the microbiome human interaction uh, or is that not a problem in the products you have? There, there may be multiple, so I stand corrected that there's somebody in the department that's working in the area. Thanks, Linda. Um, but I probably should have known, by the way, I, I was in, in your lab and Charlie's, because Danny didn't have space, so I, I actually did all my thesis with, with your equipment. Thank you. Um, so I think that in the discovery stage of, um, of our drugs, these types of technologies could be very useful because there are stages that are limited by throughput. When we study individual bacteria, we can go through tens of thousands of them, but you only learn certain things about them. You don't learn about how they behave as communities. When we study them in co-cultures, we can go through thousands of, or hundreds of possibilities, um, and you learn a lot how the, about how they interact with each other, but not about how they would behave in contact with the cells of the immune system or with the cells of the gut barrier. Uh, and so having this additional step with some degree of throughput before you go into animals to model host bacterial bacterial interactions would be very useful for discovery because by the time you bring candidates to mice, you can work with dozens of possibilities, but you're not going to be able to work with hundreds or thousands of possibilities. And there's so many, the, the, the experimental space that you have to explore is so vast, the experimental space of combinations of bacteria, that you need a way to... Um, the mice are just, they really don't replicate a lot of the features of the human system, at least with the folks that we work with. They're very frustrated with the mice. So maybe yours are more predictive. But even in no, our we have the same problems as everybody else. The human system is actually something more still, where you can grow consortia, so we can grow stable consortia. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think the moment that you show with these techniques that you can take not a simple community, but a, a complex community. Uh, and truly maintain an anaerobic environment that helps this community evolve uh, in your system in the way that uh, you would see it happening in the intestine. Uh, the, and especially if you can model useful immune responses, then yeah, you could, you could imagine is this completely obviating the need for, um, uh, for mice. But it doesn't have to obviate each other. It could be that you use both tools depending on the question you want to ask. Yeah. And, and Linda, I would I, I want to see this discussion at the break, <laughs> but I would like to leave some time for us to hear from a, a few other. This is a this is fantastic. I think this is something that Danny would really like. Um, and thank you so much, Pranat. I really appreciate it. <laughs>
I, I, I will say, Bernard, we're very interested in this problem in chemical engineering, and we have a lot of skill sets, so keep, a, keep an eye on us. This is the enthusiasm we wanted for this seminar, so thank you guys. Um, but uh, now I'd like to um, actually introduce our next speaker, uh, Pearl Huang um, from Signal Therapeutics. Pearl came to MIT for her undergraduate studies in biology uh, before going on to do her PhD at Princeton. Pearl has had a distinguished career in the pharmaceutical industry, including leadership roles at Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, and Roche Pharmaceuticals. She was also a co-founder of Beijing and served as its first CSO. Pearl is currently the president and CSO of Signal Therapeutics, which is developing drugs focused on the peripheral nervous system as an active player in human health and disease, with initial targets in oncology and inflammatory diseases. She's an active member of the MIT communities, serving both in the BE and CHEMI visiting uh, committees. And in 2021, she was elected to the MIT Corporation. Pearl, unfortunately, couldn't come join us in person today, but she was kind enough to submit her remarks uh, in advance, which we will see very shortly. Hi, everybody. My name is Pearl Huang, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be a part of today's symposium in honor of Danny Wang. I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. I'm based here in Cambridge, but unfortunately had a conflict. Uh, but I, it's really an honor to be here and to be a part of the symposium. Um, and I look forward to uh, discussions with all of you uh, around this important event. The organizers asked, asked me to start by uh, sharing with the audience what, what I took away from my MIT education uh, and how that contributed to the person that I am today. And I thought about this pretty hard and I came up with three things. You know, what did I learn at MIT? Um, the first one was the problem set is always due Friday morning. Um, the work needs to get done and when you deliver it matters. Uh, the second one uh, is that there are usually more, there's usually more than one solution to a problem, but there's always usually one solution that's better than the others. And the last thing I learned at MIT was kind of a, a version of the quote from attributed to Albert Einstein. Uh, Knowledge is certainly important but imagination is actually more important. And you need both if you are going to take on big problems and try to innovate in ways that is truly novel um, so that you can bring value uh, to the rest of the world. So with that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of, about myself and, and uh, the way I approach my job, which is to create new medicines for patients. And I've been doing this for over 31 years. I graduated from MIT in 1980 uh, and actually uh, uh, got my degree in applied biology. At one point, I think we were called food science and nutrition. Uh, but I was immediately drawn to applied biology uh, because uh, that's who I am. I like the idea of being able to pull tools together and, and solve problems with them. And to do that in the biological sciences has really been uh, been a journey and an honor uh, because our field of biology uh, has grown tremendously uh, over the lifetime of my career. Now, I have spent a fair amount of time looking at basic biology as well, and, and basic biology is something that is truly beautiful when you discover a new mechanism that has evolved in nature that explains how life forms work. But there's a big gap between basic biology and knowing when to apply applied biology. And when you decide to do with your life what I've done, which is to try to make new medicines for patients, uh, you learn very quickly that this is very difficult and the odds of success are very low. One way to approach these terrible odds is to think in terms of platforms. So very often, and you've heard in this meeting, I'm sure, and in others, people have scientific platforms that allow them to jumpstart or have a quick understanding of whatever problem it is they're trying to solve. And why does it matter? What is a platform? Why does it matter? And a platform has to allow you to answer the question, well, if your first idea works, if your platform is well-designed and well-behaved, then your second one is going to work, your third one is going to work, 
et cetera, et cetera. So by creating a platform and taking a platform approach, you can beat the odds of failure in drug discovery and development. So what are some examples of platforms? Here are just some cartoons of something that, you know, these are drugs, uh, new drug um, modalities that have evolved over the last 30 years. Danny's contribution to this, to the, to the technology that allows us to make and create these kinds of molecules that are medicines today uh, was seminal. And so the biologics are based on something that was created by nature, the antibody that's in the middle of this diagram. Um, but human beings have optimized and altered all of these uh, antibodies into many different forms, forms that can get in across the blood-brain barrier, ones that can bind to two antigens at the same time, conjugates that are combinations of small and large molecules that go to specific regions in the body, et cetera, et cetera. And it was really uh, the platform of the antibody therapeutic that allowed all these new modalities to evolve. And each one of them is a modality as well and can be used to address multiple problems simultaneously. Another example of a, of a platform is Biological Insight. And the company I run today, Signal Therapeutics, is a biological discovery platform. This is an example of something called synthetic lethality. Um, this is a, a method of finding new ways to kill cancer cells where you um, uh, where you uh, look at look for the Achilles heel in a cancer cell, which is by definition genetically deranged and therefore has changes that make it remarkable relative to a healthy cell. And so everything that comes out of this kind of a biological platform is interesting and can be moved into drug discovery and development. Sometimes a platform can be a geography, and we're all here in Boston, otherwise known here on the right as Gene Town. I've drawn a, a, a map of, taken a map of China because China is a geography as well that is very amenable to uh, the business of drug discovery and development. And so having geographical location actually can um, um, accelerate your ability to succeed and to and and to deliver new entities to the market. Sometimes a platform can be a team. And these are just some pictures of my beloved colleagues over the years. Um, what you're looking at on the left are myself with my co-founders of Beijing, a biotech, uh, which is uh, uh, headquartered in Beijing. Um, we all started in a rock climbing gym. In the middle is the bio biology team that delivered uh, BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Uh, to the patients, um, made products that are used by patients every day with melanoma and kidney cancer. And then on the right is another team, uh, therapeutic modalities, uh, a, a large group, as you can see, of scientists uh, who specialize in the design and creation and manufacturing of novel uh, biological entities for therapeutics. All of these teams are comprised of experts and people who are very good at very specific tasks and that they in, in total contribute to the entire supply chain of discovery and development. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more in detail about my biology discovery company, Signal Therapeutics. And this is a company that was started in 2017 at Flagship Pioneering. And it started with a what if question and it's a big one. Um, and that's what if peripheral nerves, which touch every organ in your system in our bodies and touch every tissue, extend into every tissue in our bodies, what if they actually played a role in human disease? And not just any role, but a role that drives the disease state itself. So it turns out nobody has taken this on before for two reasons, two main reasons. One is the field of neurobiology was really focused on the central nervous system and had assumed that peripheral nerves really weren't that interesting and were just executors of decisions, biological decisions that were made in the brain. Turns out they're wrong. Peripheral nerves uh, have their own ecosystem, they have their own controls, and they signal very independently of the central nervous system in, in dozens of scenarios. The second reason this problem hadn't been approached is it is physiological. 
And that is our peripheral nerves emanate from our spinal cord and they're, they're in these clusters called ganglia. And near the spinal cord are the nerve bodies or where all the genetic and genomic information is contained in the nerve. And the action, the site of action, where the nerve is interacting with non-neural tissues can in a human being be as far as a meter away. And so understanding the contribution of nerve signaling has escaped our more traditional methods of looking at tissues and looking at molecular signals because of that distance. And so what Signal did was create a platform that allowed us to bridge that distance, bridge that gap, and start to map out which neurons in our bodies are actually interacting with and driving human disease. If you look at this chart here, you see six diseases that are described. In each and every one of these diseases, there's reason to believe, and others have already shown, that there's something a little bit different about the peripheral nerves in these disease conditions. So we took on oncology, we took on inflammation, and we're now opening up the area of women's health because in every one of these situations, we see new nerve biology that is interacting intimately with disease tissue and there are specific signals from those nerves and between those nerves and the disease tissue that is driving the disease state. So this is just a cartoon to show you how extensively mapped the peripheral nervous system is. We know which ganglia map to which organs. And this is just a cartoon that shows you a little bit of, of what's going on here. And again, uh, if you look at the spinal cord region, that's where all the traditional genetic and genomic information is. But the site of action is very distal, very far away, and very specific for each organ type. Now, we already know uh, from other work, uh, for example, ancient Chinese medicine, that perturbation of the system can sometimes give relief to patients. And acupuncture, I would argue, is just like every other medicine we have, sometimes it works. But we're looking for a way to create medicines that work all of the time in the right patients. And to do that, we had to create a platform. And we use this platform, as I mentioned earlier, one of the fundamental pieces of this platform was to be able to map which neurons are involved in disease. But we use it in a very systematic way. We first establish that neurons have an anatomical connection uh, to the disease tissue. And then we establish that that connection results in a functional change in the disease state. And then we, we demonstrate dependency on the nerve signaling, and we call it exoneural signaling because it's outside the CNS and it's not focused on nerve-nerve interactions, but nerve-non-nerve interactions, therefore outside the current realm of neurobiology. We use tools that, that help us understand the clinical dependency of these signals and of this new biology. And then we identify target dependencies, which allow us to demonstrate uh, that uh, if you perturbate a single signal in the disease environment, that you get benefit. And the output of this platform are new exoneural medicines and a better understanding of human disease, which is accompanied by clinical tools we call biomarkers. So here are just a couple of examples of the work that we do. What you're looking at here for the first time is the demonstration of the characterization of new neural outgrowth uh, as part of a pancreatic cancer, uh, pancreatic tumor. Uh, in order to visualize this, we have to use a technique called clarity imaging. This was a, uh, an imaging technology that was developed by neurobiologists to map the fine structure of neurons in the brain. Uh, we're using it to map the fine structure of neurons in tumors. And this is a pancreatic tumor, which has essentially been made invisible by this technique. And you can see when you do that, you can see all in pink, the new neuron, neurons that are growing to be a part of this tumor microenvironment. And we've highlighted the blood vessels as well. Uh, it's already known that blood vessel growth or angiogenesis is a hallmark of cancer. And I have to say in every uh, solid tumor that we've looked at, at uh, we also see this new neurite outgrowth, new neural growth as being part of the tumor microenvironment. So this is the anatomical interaction. Um, this is an example 
in finer detail of what that anatomical interaction looks like. So what we've discovered is that there are actually certain kinds of cancers that like to form very intimate interactions with neurons. And on the left, you're seeing a small cell lung cancer cell, and you can see that neurites have formed very distinct um, uh, uh, structures with this, with this particular kind of cancer cell. On the right-hand side, uh, this is one of our electron micrographs, pancreatic tumor cells also love to talk to neurons. And when you actually grow them in close proximity to each other, you can see that they form these electron-dense regions, uh, which suggests to us that they're forming synaptic type structures for communication between neurons and the tumor cell itself. What are the anatomical functional uh, consequences of this? Well, it turns out that when you put neurons and certain tumor cells in close proximity to each other, uh, if you stimulate that uh, neuron distally, you can see that the signal as it goes through the neurites is transferred directly into the cancer cells. And we're visualizing, visualizing this through looking at calcium flux. And in this case, we're again looking at small cell lung cancer cells. So not only do the neurons uh, become a part of the tuber microenvironment, but they can form direct interactions with cancer cells and they can stimulate signaling in those cancer cells that contribute to growth, uh, metastasis and other functions. So what happens if you perturbate that calcium um, uh, signaling? So uh, signal scientists took this biology and decided to, to see if they could find a target, a gene, uh, a protein uh, that actually interfered with the signaling. And so what you're looking at here on the left is, is calcium tracing. This is a actual a visualization of the movie that I showed you uh, of calcium signals just uh, uh, traveling through individual cells. Turns out if you take those same small cell lung cancer cells and knock out uh, a target we call SF001, these cancer cells are no longer able to, um, to uh, control the signaling. Uh, and so there's much more increased signaling and it goes on for much longer. This observation uh, helped us to test molecules that interfere with this target SF001. And what you're looking at here is one of those molecules, which when you put it onto um, a, uh, uh, a cancer cell of phenocopies, this, uh, this uh, uh, increased calcium signaling being transferred from the neurons to the cancer cells. So um, the medicinal chemists and biologists at Signal decided to go ahead and start making new uh, original inhibitors uh, of this target that we call SF001. And I'll share with you here uh, uh, that uh, a molecule called SIGN2278, uh, which uh, is being tested here in uh, a mouse that has a pancreatic tumor. Uh, this tumor is derived from a human tumor, and it's one that is resistant to all uh, standard of care. And you can see a very nice dose response uh, where uh, when we treat uh, a large tumor uh, with our inhibitors, we're able to take down uh, tumor growth uh, back down to baseline. And we're continuing to work on refinement of these molecules uh, so that we can bring one to the clinic uh, uh, next year uh, for pancreatic patients and others. So one of the other things we discovered um, was that peripheral neurons, uh, the way they signal and when they signal actually has an impact on, on tumor growth in a very specific way. And, and so what you're looking at here on the left are preclinical experiments where we can ablate a, a, a neuron and then look at its effect on tumor growth. So whether you ablate them before you implant a tumor or after, um, you can see whether you do it uh, using methods, uh, using diphtheria toxin or specific uh, viruses, you can see that treatment, um, uh, ablation, neural ablation, um, results in smaller tumors. In addition, there's a very nice correlation between a size of a tumor as well as the amount of innervation. And we have been able to show that across multiple tumor types 
uh, using our imaging, quantitative imaging technology. And this has been observed in the clinic uh, for several tumor types as well. Um, Here's another uh, observation made by one of our collaborators. And this is looking at um, uh, another way of manipulating neurons. Uh, uh, and they're NAV 1.8 neurons, which is a specific subset of sensory neurons. And it turns out here, um, you're looking here in black at the growth of a tumor in this model. If you ablate, you reduce growth. But if you stimulate, you actually increase growth. So this interaction is going in both directions. And we have uh, the opportunity to interfere with the signaling in both directions as well. Turns out another discovery we've made in exploring the, the role of neurons in tumor genesis is that in a tumor microenvironment, a new kind of, tumor, of, of neuron uh, arises, and we call it a TAN or tumor-associated neuron. Here you're looking at single-cell RNA-seq of of dorsal root ganglia that are associated with uh, tissue in a specific spot in an animal. And here's the same spot uh, where a tumor has been implanted. What you see is a new neuron with a new gene expression signature. And uh, we see it not just in one tumor type preclinically, but in others as well. And this is a new subclass of neurons. It's in the nociceptor family. It has a sensory neuron origin but it is unique to the tumor state. And as it turns out, our scientists have discovered that the tumor associated neurons have an effect on the tumor microenvironment. Now I've shared with you examples of how neurons are talking directly to, um, how neurons are talking directly to immune cells in the tumor microenvironment or talking directly to, to cancer cells in the tumor microenvironment. In this case, we discovered that these TANs are talking to the immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. And what they actually do is they arrest um, macrophages into the anti-inflammatory state. Unlocking that anti-inflammatory state enables us to go in and uh, attack tumors uh, to become more pro-inflammatory. And with these insights, you get, um, uh, you get uh, results like this. And so our platform, which we call EMP or Exoneural Medicines Platform, putting together imaging, neural manipulation, uh, uh, gene manipulation, and finally, um, creation of novel molecules, in this case, biologics, we've been able to identify a target uh, and uh, that gives us a powerful anti-tumor activity. These are two of our antibodies. And we're going into uh, models where um, uh, tumors are growing in animals with complete immune systems and complete, obviously, nervous systems. And when we block the specific signal, which we've discovered through our platform, we see that about 20% of our animals uh, uh, give us cures. That is, the tumors go away completely. Not only that, but in those same animals where we re-challenge with new tumor to grow in the animal, that, uh, uh, that the tumor cannot take, suggesting to us a complete rewiring of the immune system due to the inhibition of this novel target that has come out of our TAN and uh, our, our understanding of TAN uh, neurons uh, and uh, our platform. So in summary, we think of neurons um, and exoneurogenesis as a new fundamental driver of cancer or a hallmark of cancer as coined by uh, Bob Weinberg and Doug Hanahan. And so just as 30 years ago, when the idea of angiogenesis as a driver of, of tumor genesis was introduced, uh, we now know that anti-angiogenic therapies are, uh, have given benefit to millions of patients and are still generating billions of dollars a year of revenue for, um, for um, pharmaceutical uh, companies and healthcare industry. In that same way, we view anti-exoneural therapies with the same potential. And so what we've done here is in our cartoon, we've drawn the previously 
unknown, previously unseen component of the tumor microenvironment, and that is the peripheral neurons. And just another picture on the bottom, uh, a patient's sample. This is a lung tumor, uh, and you can see all the new neurite outgrowth uh, emanating from that tissue to become a part of that tumor microenvironment. We know that those neurons are contributing to tumor genesis. And through our platform, through our understanding of, of basic biology, but also our applied tools that allow us to manipulate neurons, that allow us to look at every cell in a dorsal root ganglia, that allow us to knock out every gene in any cell we want, uh, powerfully gives us therapeutics. Before I leave, I wanna share with you some of my colleagues. On the left here is the team that has built Signal. Uh, I joined the company in early 2019, and these are the scientists and individuals who have built this whole new field of biology, as well as a pipeline, a nascent pipeline of agents to take to the clinic. Our founders include Nubar and Avakavegian, and of course, Doug Cole is a member of our board, and he's a managing partner at Flagship Pioneering. With that, I end my talk. I thank you for your attention. I thank the organizers once again for inviting me to be a part of this symposium. I'm putting my email here in case anybody wants to reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you if you want to hear more or even if you want to talk about something else, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thank you to, to the organizers of the Wang Symposium. <laughs>